Well, good morning, everyone. I know everyone's kind of filing in from what I hope were some really exciting and engaging side events this morning. And I hope everyone enjoyed themselves last night at the Borlaug Field Award. Hope you all had a chance to see our beautiful Hall of Laureates. Um, again, my name is Morgan Day. I'm the Director of Planning here at the World Food Prize. And I uh, am thrilled this morning. Our, our lineup of panels this morning is chock full of leaders. Um, and this morning, we're really focusing on agriculture and food insecurity in Africa. But I hope that there are some really broader themes that we can draw out that will be relevant uh, regardless of region. I am absolutely thrilled to be introducing our first panel, uh, Dr. Uh, Lindue Sibanda. Uh, is bringing to life the real experiences from Africa with her panel. Last year, she led a panel focusing on African women scientists, uh, which included the president of the Republic of Mauritius, Amina Groove Fakim. And this year, she's bringing together fresh voices from African youth. The Aspen New Voices Fellows, uh, several of them are going to be a part of the panel, as well as uh, Fanner Pan policy expert to share their personal experiences about how Africa's youth can secure the farming future. And if you'll please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Thank you very much, Morgan, for that introduction, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm excited to be hosting this panel at a time when the African Union has declared 2017 as the year in which we are harnessing the demographic dividend by investing in the youth. Now, I've deliberately set away from the panel because according to the African Union, youth is 15 to 35, and I'm way beyond that. <laughs> I'm excited because we have 54 countries in Africa. We have taken the best of the best, just four countries. I'm going to take you to Uganda. I'm going to take you to Kenya. I'm going to take you to Mali and I'm going to take you to Zimbabwe, all in an effort to showcase the best of the best in the youth that are doing it and leading by example. Emma, you were here four years ago, and I remember Ambassador Queen showing off that he has been to a one-acre farm that does it all. Take us to your farm. Just paint a picture. What is happening right now in Uganda at your farm? I my acre is uh, one, ac my farm is one acre, and I divided it in two quarters. Um, a quarter goes for the pigs, and another quarter goes for the plantain, matoke, the sauce type of food. And then a tenth goes to the fish, a tenth goes to the cattle, another, another tenth goes to the vegetables. And another tenth is just left for, just in case I need to do something else. I also have chickens on the same farm. Now, at 4 a.m., I wake up, and I hold a board meeting with my animals and the plants. <laughs> and they only say one thing, but if you, the plants take, talk to me and the cows and the cattle and everything, say, if you take care of us, we shall take care of you all the way to the bank. And that way, I get energized and uh, start working. And I'm very happy to tell you that. I'm able to provide for my family. I look after my kids, give them food, nutritious food at that, from the farm. And I also am able to take them to school, give them medical attention, give them warm clothing, trendy ones at that. So from the proceeds I get from the farm. But Emma, you are a qualified veterinarian. Yes. White collar job, I know you do cattle front and back. But white collar job, yeah? yeah. Why, why, why go into something like farming? I mean, and smallholder farming, not just farming on a one acre farm. Surely there's 
better things to be doing uh, than farming. Actually, the best white collar job I have is farming. You know what? Um, it seems dirty, but that's green gold. So that's why I decided to go there for the so green gold. How many people are you employing at that farm? All right now, I employ about five people. My husband actually is my farm manager. So wow. I employ him as my farm manager. So right now, he's uh, busy taking care of the animals and everything. And But this is one thing I've decided to do as well. After being successful in farming, I decided to train. Uh, my, my farm is a demonstration farm. So I decided to train people, main emphasis on the youth and the women, better methods of farming, because I want everyone to be successful like I do. And then, bearing in mind that uh, an average Ugandan is 14 years, I decided to also, my husband and I decided to open up a primary school. Wow. Now, this primary school is a normal school, and it teaches only the three things Africans are failed to teach their children. It's a school for African farm, children for African farmers. It teaches time management through farming because farming is the greatest timekeeper. If you don't plant or if you don't plow on time, then you're going to miss on the rainy season. It's right now raining at home. So if you didn't plan on time and plow and everything, remember we don't have tractors, so you need to use your hands and oaks plow. So we teach them how to manage time through farming, and then we teach them the value of money. We teach them that if you, like each child from eight years to 12 years is given a banana plant, because that's our step of food. So we give them a, a, a banana plant to look after. This enables them to have knowledge, also to care and to be responsible. And then we teach them that this thing that you have is going to give you money. So you don't just plant and leave it. So they have to look after it, make sure they have quality uh, products. And then they sell the product. And then we teach them the other value, that the value of money, that is value of money. And then we teach them the culture of saving. So they are young children. So a young child knows I don't have anything, I don't have to buy food, I don't have to do this, but I'm going to, so we teach them, you can buy candy, but you need to save. So each child in my school has a bank account. Wow. So that's what I do. Thank you. Time management, value of, value money, of money, and the culture of saving. And the culture of saving. Well done, Emma. Thank you. Let me stay with Uganda. Thank you. Talk about giving back to your community. So Emma is farming. You are in Uganda, and you've chosen to go into advisory services. What help can you give to, to Emma's farm? What are you doing in Uganda on advisory services? So uh, basically, I work with the Wanaka Fund, and we support smallholder farmers in a, a region called Busoga. It's in a, the eastern part of the country and one of the poorest uh, in the country. Uh, what we do is that uh, we get these farmers, uh, train them on better farming practices, and then we give them uh, credit uh, in the form of inputs. And uh, we have seen a lot of uh, actual results because a typical farmer in that region only harvests about five bags of maize in one acre. That is about 500 kilos. Mm -hmm. But through the work that we have done, we have farmers now harvesting up to 40 bags an acre. So uh, it, it, they, they have now the food that they need. They can sell some of this uh, grain to actually take their kids to school and meet other household needs. Moses, this is 2017. We heard that fall armyworm had devastated parts of Uganda. You moved from five to 40 bags and you are not touched by fall armyworm, no diseases, you're good? Yeah, actually we, 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 most of the farmers suffered from the fall armyworm. Okay. Uh, it destroyed the maize at the early stage. Uh, even when uh, we used the advisory by Ministry of Agriculture to actually advise the farmers, they could spray uh, the maize and uh, the, the small lava would actually die, and then like different stages of the lava would keep surviving, and ate the maize up to the grain stage. Mm -hmm. And this affected the quality of the maize that they produced. So even if the farmer got the 40, kilo, uh, 40 bags I was referring to, yeah. 
the price of their maize was actually very low because of the poor quality. And, and you could feel the frustration of farmers. They were using various kinds of chemicals, including acaricides. Oh my goodness. Uh, Dr. What Emma. Is a, what is an acaricide? Acaricide is uh, uh, an insecticide for tick control. Oh. But I think because it smells so bad, the farmers thought it would chase away the moth. And, and for us who were training the farmers, when you go to the garden, you could actually get itches on your skin. And then we, we get scared because w when you look at the aggravates, we actually have chemicals which are banned in the Ugandan market. Mm -hmm. Roundup, uh, 2,4-D, a lot of things. And, and I think it's very important that we actually train farmers so there's better. So there, there is a job for advisory services, there yeah. is a job for regulatory services from government, and there's a job for responsible uh, chemical de um, deployment by the industry. Yes. But take me back, you said you work in a poor region. I'll tell you one thing, my grandfather never saw himself as being poor because he always said, I've invested in all these children, that's labor for me, that's income for me. What makes an African village poor? What, why do you say they're poor? So uh, I, I will talk about my personal story, and I'm actually a grandson uh, to somebody who had five wives, my grandfather, and produced 45 children. 45 children. 45 children. That's well. Yes, yeah, so in... in <laughs> <laughs> I was talking 12, but 45, that's rich. Yes, during, during their time, they, they, they felt pride by having a, a lot of wives and uh, having so many children. But the result was that they couldn't have enough food in the household. My father actually tells me of uh, when they would ring a bell just to call them for a meal. They ring a bell at Yes, meal and, and if you delayed to run to the eating table you would likely miss the food. Wow. So uh, what was painful to him was one day when he actually performed very well uh, at school and he went with a report card. He tells me he was the first in his class all through except once when he became second after losing only two marks. But with the good results, he went to his father and said, I have actually been admitted to a technical school and I need fees. And the father said, I cannot waste time with you. You already know how to count and that is it for you. So my father ended up becoming a peasant uh, farmer. Uh, peasant meaning growing small stuff for survival. But through his hard work, he was actually able to take me to school and I, I got a degree in agriculture and another in environment. And I feel that the job that I have now to actually serve this group of farmers is the best job in the world. Because when you look at Africa, we are the youngest population in the world. And whatever we are doing for these smallholders is actually a service to these young people who probably will be lucky like myself and, and get something else they can actually do in the future. Thank you so much for that story of your life. Thank you, and that you're serving your community by giving back. Thank you, Moses. Over to you, Messi. You're working for one of the most prestigious CGIR centers. There's 17 of them, but we're still talking about children going to bed hungry children being sent off school because they haven't had enough food. What does that mean to you? What are you guys doing? Actually, I can really relate to this story because um, when my mother was pregnant with me, she was a farmer, she had anemia. As a result, I was born too early at 32 weeks, barely a pound. The doctors gave me 72 hours to live. I'm so happy to be alive today and what I do with the life I've been given is really to link agriculture to nutrition outcomes because that's the link that is broken. So when I go to farming communities, I feel like one of them. I teach them how to increase production diversity so they have diverse foods. When they make a little money, I teach them to prioritize nutrition, good food, health care, uh, sanitation. This is important for nutrition. 
And when women are pregnant or they're lactating, I help them to balance their time and their energy by using technologies that are time-saving, labor-saving. This is important to me. But more importantly, I help governments promote nutrition policies, like school feeding policies, where agriculture can uh, now feed schools. The school becomes a market and children thrive. But another thing is my research work on biofortified beans. Biofortified beans? Yes. Right. I really push for biofortification because I've seen it work. Our study in Rwanda, it showed that biofortified beans can resolve anemia, can even improve brain function in women. So I've seen agriculture stop the very thing that almost cost me my life. And that's why I push for it. Wow. Wow. I mean, we talk about hidden hunger. When I look at you now, fully grown, I would never <laughs> think that. So how do we communicate this message, you know, to say there's something you're missing. They, they, there's, there's hidden hunger in you. I mean, what Moses was telling us was tummy feel. Yes. But what you are bringing is, is the hidden hunger that, that led to premature birth at 36 weeks, and not many people survive. Currently, one in three deaths are attributed to malnutrition in Africa, and you are the success story to do the work. So how do we deal with this divide? I mean, my own grandmother, Emma's farm now, has got cattle, pigs, everything. There's all the diversity that she needs. What has gone wrong in the agriculture system? And I go back to the 17 CG centers. What, what is happening? Because we've got all the core commodities across the 17. Why is this not coming to bear at household level, at the smallholder farm level? What is broken? I think what I have to mention is uh, what I see in communities. You know, we walk down the street and we all look the same and we think we are all okay. So it, it takes a mind shift to be able to say there's something we don't see, but we need to be aware of it. Until 10 years ago, the CG was still pushing calories. So we are learning that quality is important. So nutrition, education and promotion is critical. But I need this in schools. I need this in social media, in the radio, in communities. When we talk, we have to talk about diversity. We have to embrace diversity. We have to make this part of our message. Thank you, and thank you for that story. And uh, congratulations. We have you, thanks to technology and yeah. knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had Uganda. It's uh, farming, smallholder farming. It's advisory services from Moses. It's nutrition from Messi. But we're all being told that for agriculture to be cool for the youth, they want to move up the value chain. They want to see money. And, and they view smallholder farming as more of subsistence type. We've got Salif from Mali. Hi. You are the big bucks man here. Uh, <laughs> Tell us, when does the till tick? What do you do? Um, so thank you, everyone. First of all, don't be fooled. Um, so I was a, a PhD candidate about six years ago up at Purdue, uh, studying political science, international relations, so nothing really directly related to uh, agriculture. And the stipend I made 10 years ago as a graduate teaching assistant is more than I make today. So for the entrepreneurs out there, just, just that's, that's, that's the cold hard, <laughs> that's, the, that's the cold hard truth. Um, I have zero regrets. I have, um, this is something that I've been committed to basically since I was born. I was born in Rome. My dad also went to Purdue. He got his Ag Econ degree there in the 80s. Um, so when he was posted to the FAO as a young professional, and then uh, a few years later, moved to Ethiopia. So I grew up in Ethiopia in the 80s when, unfortunately, Ethiopia was synonymous with, with malnutrition and hunger. And at the time, I, I, I remember a story when someone was telling me about South Park and Starve and Marvin, and I couldn't understand you know, the, you know, what they were talking about. But, so this issue of hunger is something that is just deep. I would say it's deep, uh, it's deep for me. But, you know, what... 
and things are going well. I don't wanna, I wanna, I wanna emphasize that, but what do you need to do to ensure that you succeed as an entrepreneur in the space? I think number one is the commitment and the vision that is non-negotiable, and to have a vetted, no BS action plan, and then the work and the ethic to put that action plan into, into motion, and that's what's gonna allow you, because it's gonna happen when the adversity hits, when the things that you expected to happen doesn't happen, you're not gonna panic. Okay, so um, this theme has been, um, the theme of youth and agriculture is something that it's almost become a gravy train. Excuse me if I can, uh, I can be a bit blunt. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of energy, or a lot of attention. There's a lot of programs, a lot of projects, a lot of consultants making a lot of money a lot of economic opportunities for those consultants to supposedly create economic opportunities for young people. And I don't want to be a hypocrite because I'm one that benefited from that. Mm -hmm. um, so I also do a lot of agribusiness consulting and in fact, it's income from doing that consulting that allowed me to invest in Malo. Okay. So Malo would be dead today because I moved back in 2011. Six months later, we had a coup d'etat. Al-Qaeda basically had half the country under occupation from Timbuktu all the way to south of, of Mopti. All the funders that we had lined up dried up. USAID left the country. Peace Corps left the country. Mali was basically closed. closed. Yeah. Um, my professor said to come back and finish my dissertation and I decided to not <laughs> heed that advice. I, I, we decided to, 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 um, to stick it through. And Really, the, the moment, the opportunity that we had was, as I mentioned, my dad retired at about the same time, took his entire pension, his entire life savings, and basically said, kids, go build me the farm that I always wanted mm. since I was a poor child growing up in Western, in Mali. Yeah. He went to Israel, we went online, we found basically what are the technologies out there, and we went and built a 10 acre, so four hectare, a 10 acre farm outside of Bamako, so it's a peri-urban farm. And it was tough. I mean, the first few years was, 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 was grueling. Cause but who gave you the skills? I mean, you're trained, you're doing international yeah, relations, yeah. and now you're back building a farm. I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting there. Yeah. I'm getting there. So, so Excel row cropping is very different from like real row cropping. So I was really good at Excel. Um, so, I, so I have, it's a family business. So, you know, my dad, too, he's an economist. Um, I had a younger brother who did not do so well in school, like a lot of young people, but this was an opportunity for him to kind of get his life back on track, so he became the farm manager. And he had a baptism of fire. And the, and the person that changed his life was in, in, the, in the Egyptian government had an agronomist as part of the bilateral relations between Mali and Egypt, sent an Egyptian agronomist to Mali. I think for four years, nobody called him. He was just bored watching TV at home until he heard that there was this young 18-year-old kid, my brother, who got thrust with this hundreds of thousands of dollars just got invested in this farm, trying to grow tomatoes and all this technology, but had, had difficulty. So he basically was mentored my, my little brother. And that's how my little brother learned to, to farm. So I work with him. Technically, I'm not the strongest, but we built tools to manage the business from a technical standpoint, man, like you know, human resources standpoint, the economic standpoint, and today we get paid today to provide advice to others. And our, and our flagship, our first customer, our first client was a gold mining company in Western Mali, controversial, extractive. Some of you maybe know a little bit of African history. If you Google Mansa Musa, you'll learn about the wealth, the enormous wealth in this part of the world that has been extracted for for, for centuries, and they hired us to design a program for them because they're worried about two things. The, 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 the legal mining, the young people yeah. that are frustrated and are you know, engaging in legal mining, and second, is there a way for them to reduce their food costs? Because they have thousands of employees from Australia, from South Africa, and they're importing food from, from long distances. So the, the, sim the program was simple, year one training school, so we designed a training school based on our family farm, Started with 100 kids. Not everybody made it, and that's why it's designed, it's designed that way. We don't want everyone to make it. Now, the ones that made it now have been placed this year on five additional incubation farms. 
So each person that goes to the program knows how to produce horticulture. They can do dairy, they can do poultry, they can do aquaculture, and it's them that are feeding the mine workers wow. and accessing to market. So what's your relationship with these trainees? Are they still reporting to you? I mean, what's your business line there? We moved on because we're consultants. Okay. Um, and now we are, we are, we're, we're working on two additional projects that sp spoke, uh, focus on this. Uh, one is a USAID-funded project uh, with uh, AVRDC, the World Vegetable Center. And that is, uh, again, our role is very simple, is the business side. We have a vetted business plan and tools, so we take a young, committed individual or a team and then connect them to, to the market. So we've had two commit, uh, two wholesalers commit to buy all the produce that are, the, 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 the youth that are benefiting from this program are gonna, are, are gonna benefit. So one thing that's clear is that uh, you train, but you also target. You, 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 not everybody makes it through the training. And for those that make it, they come up with a clear plan, and it's about business, and it's about the opportunity and the skill that you've given them that carries them through. So that, that's your core business. It is, and, and, and if there's one um, field or one domain, I mean, agriculture does not joke. Uh, farming does not joke, right? Like, it's just, it just don't. Like, if you neglect your, your plant, your seedling, you'll see the results instantly. If you're sloppy, you're lazy, you're, 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 you don't do the work, you'll get, the, you, you'll get that. And the thing you have is that too many people, and, and I speak for Mali, my own country, the, the, the problem of injustice and impunity, where people who are getting all these resources, all these programs, all these grants, a lot of them don't deserve it. Yeah. And the ones that do are being left behind, and they're the ones that are being frustrated, they're the ones that are being recruited by extremist groups, they're the ones that are angry, yeah. they're the ones that end up being suicide bombers. So if we don't go back to that just ethical value-based system, we will continue pumping money, and it'll actually make the problem worse. And that is my that is my fear, and I but I'm, I'm optimistic that we won't we can we can solve the problem. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our businessman in the room, Saleh. <laughs> farming, farming is no joke, he says, <laughs> and he's making sure he brings the best of the best out of Mali, and that they feed themselves, and not just feed Mali. Hopefully, you'll be feeding the continent. Thank you so much, Saleh. I'll come back to you. Now over to you, Tembi. We've heard about the smallholder farm that's thriving. We've heard about the challenges in advisory services. We've heard about the challenge of malnutrition and the challenge of governments that dish out help without targeting. What is it that you're doing on the policy front? What can be done to alleviate all these challenges, which to me are really about governments not having their acts together, policies that are broken? How do we fix this brokenness? Well, we have excellent policies on paper. I mean, if they were to be marked by university professors, they'll probably be A plus papers. Because they read really well in English and in French and in Portuguese and the other languages that we have in Africa. But the one thing that's lacking is that they are not informed by the people that are actually facing the challenges. There's a disconnect between the policymakers and the people that are working on the ground. The young people are not consulted, and therefore the policy miss the actual um, challenges that they, they need to, to address. What we are doing at FANAPAN is trying to bridge that gap. We are looking at what's the message that's out there. We know the challenges, but what has research done to try and address the challenges? And what is science saying? But at the same time, we know that researchers are not good communicators. So the research might be there, but it's sitting on shelf, and nothing is being done about it. It's not feeding into the policy processes. So we're saying, who are the best messengers to actually carry that message that the researchers have come up with? Can the young people speak for themselves? Can they communicate to the policymakers exactly what they want to see happening? But at the same time, we're also saying, what are the platforms where young people can engage? The ministerial meetings are closed meetings. They don't invite. They, they talk to themselves, yes, that's correct. So we're saying what platforms 
uh, can we have so that young people are engaging? And we have also found that um, we talk a lot at the global level and at the regional level, but there's little talk at community level. So we are also trying to see how can we get young farmers, women farmers at community level also inputting into the, uh, into the policy so process. what are you doing about it? We have developed a, theater, uh, a tool that we call poly, a Theater for Policy Advocacy. It's a culturally sensitive tool where we use theater as a way of bringing research results from the universities, from the research institutions to the village. And we get the farmers at that level to actually validate the research by saying, yes, that speaks to me, or no, that is too far-fetched. So the, uh, the, the way we do it is that we have theatre performances at community level, which are then followed by dialogues, where different groups of community members, the youth on their own, the women on their own, and the men, they actually take apart the, the performance to say, I identify with that, with that person because these are the challenges that I'm actually facing. So by using theatre and presenting a, a challenge through an actor, people are free to engage and they are free to actually say and what could be. Identifying the policy development process yes. and making it tangible so yes. the evidence is real. Yes, that's what we are doing. We are making it simple. We're saying that policy is not out of reach. The farmers, the youth, they can get involved. They just need to have the right engagement platforms. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you're burning to engage with this panel. I'm going to take a couple of questions. There are mics on the side. If you can just line up, I can see one of the mics there. If you are burning to engage with the youth and ask a couple of questions, this is your time. I can see Gordon walking to the mic. No. So there's, where Gordon is, there's a mic. Kwesi, you're going to the mic? All right. There's another one on this side. So if we can have people line up as uh, the panel will take the questions. Over to you, Kwesi. Thank you very much, uh, Lindiwe. It's so heartening that youth has become a key issue in the sort of subject matter we have been discussing. I mean, if you go back to three, four, five World Food Prize events, you will hear youth, youth, youth being mentioned. But I think what is different now is that we are beginning to see youth with evidence of engagement. I think there's too much talk at times. We really need more and more examples of youth coming in to actually showcase what they have been able to do. It may not be perfect, but they are doing it. And so the challenge for all of us, whichever organization or institution we come from, is a challenge of engagement. In the same vein, we have heard from our lady in the extreme that the problem is not just policies. If you go in there, I hear we can even score A1 if we are scored by a university professor, and that the problem is actually the implementation. I want to make a call that we need advocacy at two levels. First of all, we need advocacy at the level of policy making, you know, penetration in countries. I've just come from a side event of the Alliance Against Hunger, working with staff, and they are doing very good work, linking up with congressmen and trying to influence the policy of the U.S. government towards food and agriculture. And I would like to see developing country networks setting up at that level, but that alone is not enough. We also need to have on the ground level uh, advocacy where we are actually implementing things to show that it can work and it can change things. So that's my... My, my wish and my call that the next food, World Food Prize, we will have specific evidence-based examples of how this has worked at the two levels. Thank you very much, Kwesi. That's IITA. There is a promise for the next uh, World Food Prize. Thank you. Over to you. Please keep them short. We just want to capture as many questions so that the panelists have time to respond. I am Marceline Egnen from uh, Tuskegee University. 
originally from Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, your stories are very uh, touching, especially Moses. Um, the fact that your farmers are using so many harsh chemicals. And how do we educate the youth, the upcoming, the next generation farmers, how to uh, sustainably use uh, um, um, integrated uh, pest management to uh, 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 make sure that they have better crop. Also, this should take us back into um, starting again the dialogue of engineer crops, whether transgenic or genome editing crop that can help the plant uh, natural biological defense system so that we use less and less of those uh, harsh chemical and better for the environment. So that would be my question. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Edson, Your name, please. Yeah, Edson PC from the African Development Bank, and I coordinate the Enable Youth Program. So it's really great to hear you know, all, the, all these stories here, and especially I like uh, my sister. Mic, if you would please speak to the mic. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, and especially the, uh, my sister from Uganda, who's built a school, and you're starting agriculture very early at the primary, uh, uh, the primary stage. I think that's very important. Um, but I've got a question for my uh, Salif Niang from uh, Mali, right? Yes, I think you've uh, gave us a reality dose that what you're earning now as an agripreneur is less than what you were earning <laughs> 10 years ago as a grad student. But here I am at the African Development Bank trying to excite all the youth on the continent to get into agribusiness. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, in, in Mali, okay? Uh, and Okay, I've seen your model. You're you know, working with one or two, you know, and uh, you know, training a few uh, agripreneurs. But here we're being told we have 420 million youth on the continent, uh, 12 million coming into the job market every year, and there's only 3 million jobs. So we have a huge gap of 9 million uh, jobs. You know. One, in Mali, how can we, um, some of your ideas, you know, how do we scale what you're doing, you know? As government, as you know, development partners, you know, I like your ideas. How can we scale this up? Uh, but also, um, give us the idea on private sector. You're a private, you know, uh, you know, private sector. What what support can government, you know, how can they best come in? Because we work a lot with the government, the public sector. I'd like to hear your thoughts, especially with the Mali example. Thank you. Thank you, Salif. We want money. Tell us how we can make it happen. I've got two more. Then I'll close the questions. Over to you, ladies. Okay. My name is uh, Esther Kimani from Kenya. I work with the Kenya Agricultural Livestock Research Organization. And my question to the panelists is, um, how would you want the research organization to engage with the youth and the issues that you are facing? Yeah, we, um, how do you want us to engage? You just don't want to come from known and dump things on you or, um, but yeah, how would you like to see that happening? Thank you. My name is Florence Wambogo. Uh, I work with an organization called Africa Harvest in Africa. Volume. My name is Florence Wambogo. I work with an, an organization called Africa Harvest in Africa. Uh, mine is a question and a comment. I've been working with the youth. The organization is uh, involved in technology transfer grassroots level between private sector as well as from um, other international organizations along the value chain. And with that, we have found that it's hard just to put the youth in a straight jacket. They have their own innovative ideas, how they want to engage. For example, in one project, we were working on sorghum, and they decided it's better instead of selling their sorghum, turn it to feed, and they start chicken business and eggs business, entrepreneurship, and making money. And so I realize in this, try to engage the youth, allowing innovation and the creativity is very, very important and flexibility. Another very interesting observation is about another experience I have in, in, a, in our church. I go to a big church, about 10,000 members. And I was asked to start uh, 
I use a, a, a entrepreneurship business in agriculture. First time I had the youth showed up. Uh, within a short time, we got about 650 youth all coming and networking. We meet once in a month. But to me, the most interesting thing out of this is the most powerful tool have been them exchanging their own ideas, opening the platform, having their own WhatsApp group, having their own uh, exchange of ideas and helping each other. How are we making money? Where are we losing money? So I actually bring speakers once in a month to, to actually target the area where they're having the biggest challenge. Otherwise, they're learning from each other, they're learning from each other's mistakes, and they are moving forward very well. So I'll say, even as we come up with some concrete ideas, let us allow for flexibility, creativity, and most important, the youth learning from other youth. Thank you. Thank you very much for those experiences from the ground. What I would like to hear from the panel, you've heard the suggestions, the recommendations, but there's nothing that beats youth solving the challenges that face the youth. You are the, the, the champions. You are the ones who will lift the millions. Currently, one in two Africans are below 35. What that means is there's a whole army that you all have to lift. What is the one challenge that you've had to overcome and that you wouldn't want other youths to face? I'll start with you, Tembi. Actually, we need to demystify part of it. If we're talking about um, developing... Policy. Yes, demystify policy. If we're talking about real engagement for youth, they have to be part of it. Uh, it's nothing for the youth without the youth. So let's make sure that they're fully engaged and they are not just tokens. Ladies and gentlemen, it's nothing for the youth without the youth. So the youth is now, it's not the future. Over to you, Salim. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to be clear, and I, I did say that, yes, I make less today, but that doesn't mean I haven't made money. What I'm, trying to, what I'm saying is that what we were able to make, we've invested it. I live well. I'm very privileged. I'm very lucky. Okay, so I, 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 I'm not trying to give that impression at, at all. And, and Malo, which is we're the first rice fortification company in Africa. We just were about to finish a deal with the World Food Program. Uh, for the first time, uh, almost 100,000 kids are going to have fortified rice uh, in school uh, all year. And it's, it's, it took six years, but it, it was, it's, it's, very, it's, a very, it's, a, it's a very good deal. Agriculture is possible. We're making money. But if you don't have that, if you don't make that commitment, that sacrifice, initially, at least in the first few years, is very difficult in the, in the long run. We try to, to, to instill in the youth. It's reduce the risk, yes. don't lose money, but think the long game. Because the investment you make today, for years and years you'll get those rewards. Once you take gold out of the ground, it's gone. Yeah. But once you invest in your soil, you can, you, can, you can have generations of wealth to come. So reduce the risk. You reduce the risk, and that's what we're doing now with the tools that we've built Excellent. when we talk to young people. So de-risk agriculture. Thank you. Messi, what's the one big challenge you had to overcome? Given my history, I had to change my mind shift. My mother said, do not go into agriculture. Then I con says, do, not do not go into agriculture. But when I was at Cornell, uh, Professor Prinstrap Anderson was singing, linking agriculture to nutrition. And I was thinking, how do I make this work for me? And I like the comments that came out. What we do now at CS is really co-create solutions with the youth. We use partnerships with civil society to be able to engage government, to engage communities. And now with the African Leaders for Nutrition at the African Development Bank, we really want to push those policies that work on nutrition. For me, I'm preaching nutrition-led agriculture, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> nutrition-led agriculture. That's your story and you're sticking to it. Thank you, Messi, and thank you to Pei Strip Anderson, who's here, the, the, the role model who made you do what you do now. Over to you, Moses. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I, I feel the youth have three questions that must be answered, and one is that does agriculture really pay? The other is that can it be a sustainable source of livelihood uh, for myself? 
And the third is that, do I have some dignity? Can I be uh, recognized as a contributor in my community if I engaged in agriculture? So dignify agriculture. Yes. And, and it comes to the issue of access to uh, the technology that you are using. Uh, if we look at the, the, the issue of seed, access to uh, seed on credit, fertilizer, and the rest, as well as the training component, but also, importantly, the tools that you are using, then we see that agriculture will be profitable and the young people will be attracted to it. So dignify agriculture, ensure farmers have access to technology, and make it profitable, make it a business. Thank you. Finally, our rock star, the farmer cum vet. Um, one of the reasons why I'm like this, I've been a successful farmer, is because I had knowledge. I went to school. So, issue is give the youth the knowledge they deserve to do whatever they need to do. And since, like I said, 14% of, uh, I mean, 70% of Africans or Ugandans are 14 years old, it means they're young, they need to give, be given knowledge. So that's why I put up that primary school to just disseminate knowledge all over. And these kids, it's amazing what they'll do. They'll not only learn it, but they're going to pass on the same information to their parents and to the neighbors, and they will be, everyone will be happy. Give knowledge. Us education, give us knowledge. That's what will make agriculture cool for the youth. Ladies and gentlemen, as I sit here and see Mommy, Judy, and Julie, <laughs> Bolog, I'm reminded of what they've always told me, that when Norm was in his last minutes, he said, take me to Africa. And today, I'm sure he's smiling because his life was about the next generation. They are real, they are doing it. Thank you very much. Join me in thanking them. Linda Way, thank you. you know, Linda Way is so incredible. She's she's my rock star. Last year, last year she brought one or two presidents from Africa and had a panel. This year, she's brought the youth. So uh, I don't know who you're going to bring back next year. Now that you're vice president Agra, but it has to be somebody. African ministers of agriculture have African to reform African ministers of policies. agriculture. All right, Morgan, put that in. It's in the program. Okay, while we're uh, getting set, I want, I want to share, Linda Way, I want to, sh and, and Emma, just share with you that uh, when I was in India a month ago, there was a medical doctor and a farmer, and she got an award at the 10th uh, anniversary summit of the Indian Council of Food and Agriculture. So it's almost all men getting awards, and she comes up, and she's the farmer of the year, and she's at the microphone, and she said the most memorable line she said, I'm more proud to tell people I'm a farmer than that I'm a doctor. And so that's... Uh, <laughs> We've got to wait for the uh, house cleaning uh, duties uh, here to finish. And uh, then uh, I will invite our uh, next speaker. So um, if you could uh, join me and uh, welcoming to uh, our stage for our morning uh, keynote address, the uh, new administrator of USAID, the Honorable Mark Green. Please. And that. So um, <clears throat> I was... Uh, Many of you know, I started a career, I'm from Dubuque, Iowa, right across the, uh, the river from Platteville in Potosi, Wisconsin. And uh, I passed the Foreign Service exam, and I was going off to Washington, and I was going to be going to London or Paris or Vienna and sipping aperitifs in fancy ballrooms. 
and I was seconded instead to USAID and sent to Vietnam in the middle of the war. You may have seen me in the Ken Burns uh, documentary. And I became a rural development advisor and was in villages in Vietnam when the Green Revolution started at the same time. Jeannie, your dad, was in India and Pakistan. And it changed the course of my life. And USAID is such an incredible organization filled with uh, officers uh, who are doing so many amazing things for the last 50 years uh, that I have been associated with it. And so that's why I was so thrilled, Administrator, the, to have you to make this schedule work so you could be here to uh, address us. Now, I was worried because he's a Wisconsin guy and went to Eau Claire State. And I lived in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and we cheered for La Crosse State. Then I looked a little further, and he has his law degree from the University of Wisconsin. I have my master's degree from Marquette in Milwaukee. So, you know, one more, th one more thing worried about in there. But saw that his role at the International Republican Institute that's out there on the ground doing such amazing things. And we have personal connections to Senator McCain and Rich Williamson. He's at the US Global Leadership uh, 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 Conference and that with Liz Schreier. I have such enormous uh, respect uh, for her and all that they're doing. Was US Ambassador in Tanzania. Uh, they're on the ground. President Kikwete was going to come today, but uh, then at the last minute, couldn't, couldn't make it. Um, and, and so looking on paper, I said, well, this is, he's got terrific preparation and probably knows Peter McPherson, who was the head of USAID, and we worked together in the Reagan administration. But the thing that really convinced me is in August, when Administrator Green was confirmed, he did a video and talked about his role in heading USAID. And I saw the video, and my staff members who are here will know that night, I sent it to them. I said, everybody has to watch this because this is a person who is inspiring and obviously inspired himself. So it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome Administrator Mark Green to the World Food Prize and to the podium. So I am delighted to be here in the house that uh, Ken Quinn built. <laughs> I am from Wisconsin. I know where Potosi is. I know where Platteville is. And uh, he went to La Crosse. I went to La Crosse's older and wiser brother, UW Eau Claire. <laughs> but now, seriously, uh, it is uh, great to be here. Um, in the brief time that I have with you, what I want to do is briefly describe what I see as three revolutions that are underway in the field of development, but point out that they are all particularly important to the area of food security. And as I do, I hope that you'll all agree that these changes, these revolutions, just might make this year's sessions of the World Food Prize the most hopeful and exciting ones ever. Now, the first of these revolutions is no surprise, it's technology. Not the everyday discoveries, but the fact that it's becoming increasingly uh, available and affordable all across the developing world. Now, my own career in development began about 30 years ago. My wife and I were teachers in a little village in Kenya in East Africa. Those were different times. In our little village, we had but one telephone. And it was a wind-up phone, and it was mounted on a wooden box in the school office. So back then, if you wanted to make a long-distance call, you'd go down to the office, you'd pick up the receiver, you'd turn the crank, and you'd say, operator, give me 662 Kisumu. You put the receiver down, go sit outside under a mango tree, wait for the phone to ring to tell you that your call had gone through. A dozen years later, I'm walking through that same village, walking along a path. I see a young boy, and I say, 
do you know Neva? One of my former students, he said, yes. I said, can you go get him for me? He said, yes, and he pulled out his mobile phone and he called her. <laughs> Five or so years after that, I was ambassador in an East African country and my African staff had cheap mobile phones and they were conducting business, they were paying their bills, they were making calls everywhere. That is the lens through which I see technology and innovation in Africa and elsewhere. This is an extraordinary time of opportunity. These innovations, this frugal technology is making the impossible possible, the unsolvable solvable. Now in West Africa, USAID is supporting a tropical weather forecasting company called Ignitia. Ignatia sends daily and seasonal forecasts via text message. It's received by 320,000 users across West Africa, increasing their awareness of rain and drought, particularly during the growing season. In Ethiopia, there are now electronic billboards in the countryside that show the latest price for coffee. And the aim is to help those remote small-scale farmers see what the actual price is, so when the unscrupulous middlemen come to try to game them, they've got ammunition. Not so many years removed from that wind-up telephone. Now, if the expansion of affordable technology is the most eye-popping revolution underway in the developing world, there's another one underway that I would argue is at least important. So when USAID was launched a little over five decades ago, something like 80% of the money that flowed from America to the developing world was traditional development assistance, what we call ODA. Today that figure is just under 10%. To be clear, it's not because ODA is fading away, it's because private financial flows have roared ahead. Large-scale philanthropy, remittances, but more than anything else, commerce and investment. The world's fastest growing economies are largely in the developing world. According to the World Bank, half the nations in Africa are now lower middle income or higher. Many of these same nations have very young citizenry. The demographics are showing that they're increasingly young. And so that means their emerging consumers are interested in the very kinds of products that U.S. businesses make and services that we provide. In short, American business has business in the developing world. The third and final revolution that I'd like to describe is the one that excites me most as administrator, and that's the rapidly changing relationship between private enterprise and the development community. Leaders in both sectors are finally figuring out how to take the unique capabilities of each, public and private, and apply them to problems that neither could take on fully alone. And this is making challenges that once seemed insurmountable very real and very achievable. It is hard to overstate how big a shift this is in the development field. For years, whether we realized it or not, USAID and others saw donors and governments as the proper drivers of progress. Private enterprise was something to uh, keep at a distance, or if you could, bend it to your will. We welcomed donations from private enterprise. We were even willing to contract with private businesses to obtain goods or receive services. Today we have moved way beyond. Today we have moved beyond grant making and contracting and instead we're collaborating. We're recognizing that agencies like USAID don't need to be the sole actors in sectors if we can be the catalytic actors in those sectors. We're rethinking how international development initiatives are designed, tested, rolled out, and we're embracing the creativity and the entrepreneurship that only the private sector can bring to the table. Feed the future which so many of you know and so many of you participate in, Feed the Future, America's Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative, in so many ways is helping to lead the charge. 
One example, Coolbot. In many parts of the world, some of you know, farmers harvest much more food than they actually need, enough to generate a modest income. But they lack access to temperature-controlled storage. And what that means is what they produce spoils before it ever gets to market. Where they should be living comfortably, they're barely scraping by. So last fall, Feed the Future called out to the private sector and research community for help. Coolbot was one of the solutions we received. An engineer in upstate New York figured out how to turn a regular window air conditioner into a low-cost cold storage unit. Coldbot. His unit costs about $300 compared to $300,000 for traditional commercial units. An American company, Store It Cold, saw the device was a huge hit with small and medium farmers back here in the Midwest. And they thought it just might work in the developing world. So we col collaborated with Store It Cold to scale Coolbots in Central America. Right product, right place, right time, it's taking off. Now, our role wasn't simply to pay them to provide their product. That's what we might have done years ago. Instead, what we tried to do is help them understand the local market and culture, and then try to use our connections to help them exploit the opportunity. The goal for Coolbot is to reach 15,000 small farmers by year's end. That will be 15,000 rural farmers and cooperatives who for the first time ever will have access to refrigerated storage. This will help them keep produce fresh until it's sold. This will give them that chance to do more than barely scrape by. And the endeavor works because it joins the special capabilities and connections of each side, public sector and private, again, to tackle problems that neither of us could do alone. As administrator, I pledge to make Coolbot and that story not the exception, but the rule in our dealings with private enterprise. As a further down payment on this approach, today I'm announcing two new exciting ventures in which USAID and private enterprise are collaborating to lift lives, lower poverty, and yeah, catalyze commerce. The first involves the Syngenta Foundation, and it takes on a key challenge in food security, getting state-of-the-art seed varieties to smallholder African farmers. Our collaboration will help local African agribusinesses gain access to high-quality seeds so they can be sold at affordable prices. It will bridge the gap between the labs that develop cutting-edge seed varieties and remote farmers and communities so desperate for high-yielding harvests. There's a second collaboration that we're announcing today. It's one with Curra Green Mountain and Root Capital. It aims to support small-scale coffee farmers who suffer from poor access to markets and private capital. Through this partnership, small-scale farmers will gain greater access to credit, learn new business concepts and strategic planning, and connect to lucrative markets that value sustainable agriculture. So I hope my message to all of you is clear. At USAID, we want to move beyond grant-making, beyond contracting, and embrace collaboration, co-design, and co-financing. I hope it gets your wheels turning. I hope it gets you thinking about the possibilities. Now, just in case it doesn't, I want to take a step further. My job now is to manually turn those wheels. I hear some squeaking as we, uh, as we do it. Instead, what I want to do is issue to everyone here a call to action, and it's a call to action that should really affect every one of us, and it's something that we have to take on and something which working together I think we can conquer. As many of you know, and I know there's been lots of talk about it, the fall armyworm is a truly a great challenge to survival of agriculture in Africa. It's a destructive pest endemic to the Americas that is now spreading all across Africa in fact, it has already been positively identified in nearly every country in sub-Saharan Africa. It has a voracious appetite, 
particularly for maize, and it's pesticide resistant. It has the potential to cause billions of dollars in damage and put hundreds of millions of lives at risk for hunger. The potential impact of the fall armyworm highlights a fundamental challenge that farmers all across Africa face. Limited access to the tools, technologies, and management practices that are really necessary to take on and manage this threat. So, as many of you know, here in the U.S., we know the armyworm problem, and we've controlled it. And we've done so by using the best science and tools that are available, from crops with built-in resistance to smart, safe pesticide use. So USAID is calling public, private, civil society, research, and university partners to channel those tools, to enlist those tools to take on this problem. Let's control the fall armyworm in Africa before it becomes a true food security crisis. We're launching this call to action to connect and mobilize our partners and ensure that Africa gets humanity's greatest thinking on this subject. As part of our role in the collaboration, I'm announcing that Feed the Future has already begun assembling like-minded international and African organizations, companies, and research institutes to mobilize their solutions to the fall armyworm epidemic. And I'm reaching out to all of you to offer you a role in this effort. In fact, I am challenging you to join us. If you're willing and interested, and if your organization can commit to this global effort, go to Feed the Future's website and tell us what you can bring to the table. 100 years ago, Teddy Roosevelt had this to say about challenges like this. He said, look, far and away, the greatest prize that life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. And I'd submit to all of you here today that sustainable agriculture, feed the future, these new partnerships, especially as applied to daunting challenges like the fall armyworm, hard work, but God knows it's work worth doing. Thank you to all of you for what you do. More importantly, thank you for what you're about to do. We appreciate it, and we promise to be there every step of the way as your partners. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mark, very much for those words. I, I, I know I'm a Brit, but I used to work for USAID. Okay, my mother's a Brit. We, we oh, okay, that's all right. No, good. Because I can understand. I, I have. I remember once in the Philippines, the embassy called me and said, "We've got a problem. Would you sort this out?" And there was a, a dam on a lake, Lake Buhi, and the villagers didn't like it. And the New People's Army was on top of the dam. And so your ambassador said, would you go and sort it out? He said, there's an armored car downstairs. And so I went there with Percy Sahisi, which many of you know from the University of the Philippines, and we sorted it out. We finally had a meeting which included both the government of the Philippines and the New People's Army to solve the problem, and they solved it. So that was, that was my early USAID experience. I, I'm delighted you stressed the, the digital technology. Uh, many of you in the room will know that I worked with Sam Dryden on that great report on digital technology. Uh, he unfortunately passed away this year, and many of you in the audience will know of him and what happened. I'm particularly delighted about the public-private partnership. It's been long overdue that we get those partnerships together. And we wish you well in turning the squeaky wheel. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. Perhaps I can get the next panel to come on. Akin and, uh, and, and Nick is somewhere there. And uh, Raj, please. And Agnes. And Hala. Yeah, you're all there. Great. This is a, a terrific panel. I don't think we've seen the like of a panel like this 
at the World Food Prize for a very long time. Uh, we have at the far end Nick Austin, who uh, was seven years as the director of the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research and has just been made the head of agriculture at the Gates Foundation uh, this year. We have Madam Halle uh, Brady, who has had a long career in the World Bank, um, particularly doing work in the Middle East and North, North Africa, but others as well, and she's director of communications from the bank. Next to her is my good friend Agnes. Uh, Agnes was a brilliant minister of agriculture in Rwanda, and you can see the consequences of her influence in Rwanda today. And then she became the head of the Alliance for Green Revolution for Africa, which is spearheading so much of the change in Africa. Next, uh, Raj Shah, who I've known for a long time, when he was uh, at the uh, Gates Foundation, became head of agriculture at the Gates Foundation, became a chief scientist at USDA for a brief period when I was chief scientist in Britain, and uh, then, then went on to become the administrator of USAID. And now is the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, and uh, I am so delighted by that appointment because of the personal connections I have with the foundation. And um, Jennifer, you are, uh, you are now a, a vice president of the African Development Bank, and you're going to moderate this, uh, this, this panel, good. But to begin with, we have uh, a 10 minute talk by, by my good friend, uh, Chief <laughs> Akin Adesena, who uh, worked with me at the Rockefeller Foundation for seven years, went on to become the Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria and had an enormous impact. I mean, you can see that uh, in particular with the great production of rice in, 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 in Nigeria. And then became the president of the African Development Bank. That, that is quite, in many ways, remarkable because they've always, always had economists, financial experts. And he, he, he's an agriculturalist. He was a man who knows about agriculture. And to have somebody like that at the head of the African Development Bank is changing things already, dramatically. And Chief, I want you to say a few words. <laughs> and then you can take over. Thanks very much, Chief Gordon. He's the, he's the big chief. He hired me at Rockefeller Foundation, so he's uh, the big chief. But uh, about being an ag person, uh, Pedro Sanchez always calls me an economist with chlorophyll, so I think that's... Uh, <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session. Um, you know, when I was elected president of the African Development Bank uh, in 2015, I made a decision to launch a Feed Africa strategy with very strong support from our board of directors. And our goal was pretty simple, to help to transform agriculture and unleash a new wave of prosperity all across rural Africa. I knew that to succeed, Africa will need strategically and creatively and collectively to pull together a whole lot of institutions, and we have so many of them all over here today. We just heard from the USAID administrator. My good friend Raj Shah used to run USAID uh, at that time as well. We have had, as you all know, a lot of latent potential for change and development, but in the main, our efforts have been dissipated. We simply have not operated at scale needed for impact. So, when I was elected president of African Development Bank, I met with my very good friend, Jim Kim, the president of the World Bank. We met in Washington in September of 2015. And we were talking about the CGIAR. Of course, I spent a decade of my life in the CGIAR. And he was beginning to get quite discouraged about funding for the CGIAR. And he said to me, well, maybe it's time to pull the plug on them. Uh, because it wasn't really going as well as he wanted. And, you know, uh, he and I had a little, you know, tete-a-tete, -tete, and I said, well, look, um, I understand uh, what you're saying, but when it was time to feed Latin America, CGI was there. When it was time to feed Asia, CGI was there. 
and it's time to feed Africa, the CGIR has to be there. So what we have to do differently is business unusual, not just business as usual. And I recall to Jim a conversation that happened many, many years ago uh, between Bob McNamara, the president then of the World Bank, and George Arar, uh, uh, the uh, president of the uh, Rockefeller Foundation in Mexico. At the time, Bob McNamara looked at his short wheat lines and said, of course, with Norman Bolo of Walkton, he was so excited, he said, you find me the technologist, and I'll find you the money. And that was how the deal was done. And this was the same deal that myself and Jim Kim agreed on we were going to do. We agreed that what's needed was to rally the CGIR system, working with the national and regional research institutions together with one common purpose, feed Africa, by rapidly scaling up agricultural technologies to millions of farmers through a coordinated technology delivery platform. The World Bank President, Jim Kim, agreed and said to me, well, I came, you're an Aggie, and so you lead and we'll follow. And that's exactly what we've been doing since that time. Nothing calls one to action more than the now famous words of our great mentor, Norman Bollock, which still rings in one's ears, and, and, and you also have it echoed in your mind all the time. Take it to the farmers. Today, colleagues, we have water-efficient maize. That's resistance to drought developed by the CGIR. And in fact, um, uh, my, my bosses at Rockefeller Foundation, Gary and, and Bob, they funded all that work. And, and Mar uh, Marianne Bazinga is somewhere, somewhere I think. Uh, she did a lot of that, that work. But it can give you good yields on that drought, but they remain on the shelf. Cassava varieties exist that can give you today 80 tons per hectare compared to 20 tons per hectare that farmers are getting but largely they remain on the shelf. Rice varieties, Monty Jones developed the new rice for Africa, Nerica rice. Of course, it can impact tremendously on rice production, but largely it's not been adopted at scale as we would like to see. And also, of course, we have the biofortified beans and orange flesh sweet potato, which you all actually awarded for the World Food Prize last year, you know, there and with a lot of potential to change everything and make sure we have uh, we can end vitamin A deficiency, stunting, and malnutrition. In short, Africa has more technologies today to help to transform its agriculture than Asia had before the Green Revolution. The technologies to feed Africa, therefore, already exist. What is needed is the will, the ability, and the commitment to take the technologies to scale, for by so doing, we will reach tens of millions of farmers. Having seen the power of several of these technologies on farmers' fields and helped to scale several of them up myself uh, in my time as Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria, I know that we don't need to test these technologies on small scale pilot scales anymore. See, Africa has so many pilots. We just don't have many planes taking off. So we need a lot of planes to take off on this. So two weeks after I became president of the African Development Bank, I called for a meeting in Dakar in, uh, with all the ministers of agriculture, the ministers of finance, and the central bank governors. In fact, I can tell you, it's the first time they all met together on that one roof. And my message was very clear, that please don't look at agriculture as just that sector. But agriculture is central to how you have macroeconomic and fiscal stabilization of countries. So therefore, you have to look at agriculture in a totally different way. And it was a meeting that made a difference. We decided that we had to change things. We had to change the trend of spending $110 billion a year importing food in the next, uh, by 2025. And that's how the technologies for African agricultural transformation, otherwise called TAAT, was born out of this major consultation. TAAT brings together global players in agriculture, the entire CGIR system, the World Bank, uh, the FAO, IFAD, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, AGRA, where Agnes is, the Rockefeller Foundation now with a new president, and national and regional agricultural research systems. It's the biggest consolidation of efforts to accelerate agricultural technology uptake in Africa. TAT is a regional technology delivery infrastructure for agriculture. 
linking countries across agroecological zones. For example, take a case of how varieties are released in Africa. You have to test them four years in one location, you test them four years in another location. If you have to take the same variety in the same agroecological zone to 10 countries, that will easily take you 40 years. And that's why we decided that the best thing to do is to take these technologies and take them across agroecological zones. There is the rice belt, there is the cassava belt, there is the savanna belt. So you have the same technology, scale them all across the region, and then change all the regulatory environments that makes it difficult for technologies to go to scale with a much needed regional spillover effects. And this is why we believe that TART will help to break these barriers down because you know, countries are simply a bunch of borders that people put across agroecological zones, pretty much. You know, and so we have to work across zones. So what we've decided to do is that TART will be done through a collectively agreed uh, central delivery platform coordinated by the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture and all the other CGIR centers with national, regional, and international research centers and par bilateral partners like USAID and the others. Today, I'm excited that 25 countries have written letters confirming their interest and readiness to support uh, TART and to help us to transform agriculture in Africa. Just tells, tells you the extent of extensive consultations that have already taken place on this major effort. TART is a transformative partnership and a landmark partnership effort. The African Development Bank, the World Bank, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Rockefeller Foundation intend to mobilize one billion US dollars to help to scale up technologies across Africa. Right now, the African Development Bank is discussing this with our board of directors, and we hope that once it is approved, we can begin the task of really taking agricultural technologies to scale. The questions you're asking is what will it do? We're trying to reach lift 40 million Africans out of extreme poverty. We believe that TART will help to produce an additional 120 million metric tons of food. So we are taking a bet, and it's a good bet. We're betting on Africa, that Africa can feed itself. We're taking a bet that with agriculture as a business, Africa will unlock its massive agricultural potential. We are taking a bet that as Africa embarks on an unprecedented agricultural industrialization, it will be able to unleash prosperity that will also lift millions out of poverty, creating new zones of prosperity to replace zones of economic misery that we have in Africa. So I would like, in closing, to thank the World Bank leadership, to thank Agra's leadership, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who have placed substantial amount of contributions towards this initiative. We'll welcome more partners to join us in this major drive to take technologies to farmers and to transform Africa's agriculture. Let's rise up and feed Africa. The solution is at our fingertips. The answers are in our hands. The vision can and will become a reality by God's grace in our lifetime. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President boss. Uh, and um, I think that that is a very exciting call for action. And I think the USAID administrator, when he made his call for action that we collaborate, co-design and co-finance, didn't know that we'd be up here right afterwards already talking about that. So I think that that's quite exciting. I mean, this is really about uh, bringing together the best thinking, the best technology, the best minds, and the best institutions uh, to take the technology that already exists around the world in terms of agricultural knowledge, the right kinds of seeds, uh, the right kinds of tilling, milling, et cetera, and getting them to the farmers. Uh, and, and as the president said, you know, these things exist and there's so much more of them now than existed during the previous Green Revolution. So what's stopping us, you know? And some of the things that do stop us are borders and so on and so forth. The, the other thing I just wanted to mention before we uh, kick off with, I think, some, some very interesting uh, remarks is this whole question of the fall armyworm, uh, which a lot of us have been discussing quite a lot since we've been here. Um, if we're able to, you know, sort of break down those barriers that the president was talking about across the different countries, it will help us also in terms of resilience. Uh, because if you look at pests 
as we were saying this morning in the fall army worm meeting, pests don't have passports and they don't wait for visas. They just move right over the border. Uh, and so if we don't take a cross-border approach to technological dissemination uh, and creating this resilience, then uh, we're all gonna be somewhat stuck. So with that, um, what I'd like to do is, is move uh, directly to the panel uh, and I'll kind of move uh, about this way. Uh, first, just Nick. Uh, I think, you know, we, we welcome the fact that Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is contributing uh, to the central, uh, you know, mechanism for TAT, T-A-T, um, and, you know, especially the Clearinghouse, and you're also providing, you know, obviously for quite some time support to the CG centers, uh, which is important and is the backbone of a lot of what we're doing. What will success of working this way to roll out technologies to Africa's farmers look like for you at uh, the Gates, Gates Foundation. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you for the opportunity to be here on this panel with such esteemed leadership. Let me first recognize Dr. Adesina's leadership, uh, exemplified with the TAAT and his achievements recognized as the 2017 World Food Prize Laureate. We're very proud to partner with the African Development Bank in the TAAT initiative uh, through our support with the CGIR centres and particularly with AGRA as a, a vital scaling partner in Africa for technologies. We know, as Dr. Asina has said, that the technologies exist to drive fundamental prosperity and lift large numbers of smallholders out of poverty in Africa. Inclusive agricultural transformation is the unifying vision within the Gates Foundation and fully aligned with the vision of, of Feed Africa and the TAAT initiative to make those technologies available to smallholder farmers. Those technologies exist, so what's failing? The system's failing. We know that yields in Africa, at cereals, for example, at 1.3 tonnes a hectare, are, are less than half of the equivalent in, in South Asia and perhaps of around about a quarter of what we can see in China. So the potential's there with existing technologies without us investing in, in, in additional technologies. We also know incongruously that the majority of the world's poor are smallholder farmers, particularly so in Africa as we see uh, the increased concentration of extreme poverty unless we get these initiatives right. So the possibilities are there waiting to be grasped. The, the uh, ability to, to, to drive that journey to prosperity. We know that economic growth or growth in the agriculture sector is so much more effective at lifting people out of poverty than growth in other sectors. So what's not working? It is complex. How do we break the complexity down into ways that matter? And the technology needs obviously evolve as the journey to prosperity evolves and as economies transform and smallholder farmers engage in new ways. So clearly the focus on staple crop production for subsistence farmer is par farmers is paramount. We have smallholders who aren't engaged formally in, in markets. To do so, need better varieties, better fertilizers to overcome the constraints, soil fertility, crop and pest disease, the fall army worm examples that we've heard. So how can systems be unblocked, systemic bottlenecks to get dry varieties onto smallholder farms and bring with that fertilisers uh, as inputs that enable surpluses to be produced. And of course, as we all know, then moving from surplus to engage in markets opens new opportunities, both on farm and off farm. Off farm in non-farm economic pursuits, so critical as we heard in the, the youth panel discussion this morning but on farm in relation to diversification, bringing with it new technology needs as smallholders then move into systems that aren't just driven through stable crop production, but bring in legumes into rotations, bring in a livestock, bring in higher value commodities. So too, demanding new technologies, vaccines, animal health products, genetics uh, in, in livestock. We also see the benefits flowing through in nutrition particularly uh, for women and girls as these systems uh, diversify both on and off farm and bring benefits to the economy more broadly. So to your question, Jennifer, what does success look like? Getting locally relevant varieties 
locally relevant technologies, locally relevant solutions to smallholder farmers. And TART is, is, is positioning to play a key role in bringing the best technologies available from the CGR system and beyond and supporting in new ways their delivery to farmers. So we, we, we're delighted and uh, excited to be part of this initiative. Thank you, Nick. So really breaking down the complexity, making it easier to allow this adoption to happen, and I suppose also uh, ensuring confidence among the farmers that they can do this, uh, which will require quite a lot of support as well. So uh, turning to you, Halle, um, from the World Bank's perspective, and you guys are going to be a huge partner uh, in this effort, particularly on getting all of what is needed in terms of the soft and hard infrastructure in the countries, so this can be absorbed. Um, from the World Bank's perspective, uh, why is transformative technology for African agriculture so important? Uh, let me also start before I answer you to uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Adesina for, uh, for uh, the prize, and uh, it's a, it's a it's the, I think it's the best and the biggest prize in agriculture, so heartfelt congratulations, uh, not just from me, but from the whole uh, management of the World Bank for you, uh, Dr. Adesina, and, and thanks, Jennifer, for inviting us. Um, the reason why we give so much importance to the technology is because we see the technology as an accelerator, as an enabler. And ultimately, what we all want to achieve is more incomes, for the poor, better resilience and productivity, better nutrition, and more employment. These are the four objectives we want to pursue. And in order to achieve these four objectives, agriculture is central. In Africa, you cannot achieve poverty alleviation without agriculture development, without major strides in agriculture development. So it's a central part of the whole development debate is to get to the bottom of the agricultural uh, development issue. And, to, and technology is a way to boost that, to accelerate that. So it's very, you know, our vision of this is very, very clear. And that's why we have very closely, we, have, we are, you know, uh, uh, we very much support the, the spirit and the objectives of the TAD program. And as you know, we are already, as Dr. Adesina mentioned, we're already very closely collaborating, and I'll, I'll mention a bit more about uh, what we plan to do specifically. So now, how do we want to work on these four areas? On the question of employment, uh, Africa is expected to see one-third of a billion new entrants in the job market by 2030. Our estimates are that about 25% of these people will get weight jobs under the best, most optimistic scenarios. How about the other 75%? What are they going to do? And agriculture, where most employment in Africa is today, is the, pro the best solution. But to look at agriculture not as pure farming, but to look at it at the whole value chain of agriculture, from the farm to the market, that is what we, you know, that's where we see a lot of the future employment of Africa coming from is through the agricultural value chains. So we have to emphasize, we have to sort of work on that. The second strand is resilience and productivity, improving resilience and productivity. Since the 1960s, most of the growth in agricultural, product, agricultural growth has been by expanding the land, expanding the, uh, the area and clearing forests or uh, bushlands to plant. Today, we have reached, you know, we can't expand that further because we will damage the ecosystems. So what we need to do is to improve productivity on those same plots of land, like a lot of Asian countries have achieved. It is doable, and a lot of African countries have achieved. It is doable, we just have to scale it up and, and implement it, and technology can be a big booster there. So that would be the second. The third, is on incomes, this relates very, very closely to the value chain issue that I mentioned earlier, because a lot of the jobs of the future will come from post-farm um, post uh, activities. You know, the, the coffee shop, uh, the restaurant, uh, the little restaurant, the little shop, these are, owned, are gonna be owned by, uh, by young people. 
and the link to the market, the, the link to the farm, from the farm to that market is going to be very important and a generator of, of income. And fourth is nutrition. If you look under, if you look at the current productivity of agriculture in Africa, and you project that into the future, you see that uh, Africa will have to import a third to half of its food needs uh, by, um, by 2030. That represents about $200 billion of import bill per year. So if that capacity to produce is local, then you can spend your $200 billion uh, on more productive uh, things and you know, to basically grow your economy through other ways. So it is essential to get that nutrition and to basically be able to feed Africa, for Africa to feed Africa, as Dr. Adesina always says. <laughs> so it is, it is really that, that goes to uh, the point that Dr. Adesina always mentions. I think uh, in order to, for these four objectives to be achieved, there are a few prerequisites. One is that the policy environment is the correct one. I think that's, uh, you know, we, we very often disregard the importance of policy. And what I mean there is, for example, uh, public, public expenditure uh, policies. You look at spending in agriculture and you see that a lot of the spending, there is no issue necessarily with the volume of money going to the agriculture sector. It's very often the way that money is allocated and how that the distribution of money is done within your, uh, a country's budget. So a look at public expenditure and within the agricultural sector and how these monies are distributed is, is quite important. Second is the question of trade and regional integration. If you don't address uh, regulations and uh, liberalization of trade and boost regional integration, that whole market creation and export capacity of African countries would not be there. So you need to do all these things in parallel with the four things I mentioned earlier. Third is, as we, we talked already about, is all the policies that will boost productivity increase, like targeted subsidies, like things like that. And fourth is policies for inclusion. We spoke about youth, the importance of bringing youth in, the importance of bringing women in, but also refugees. You know, we have a huge refugee crisis in Africa, and you have to integrate. One of the main sources of integrating these refugees into this country is through agriculture. So again, policies that will help them integrate. So the policy environment is very important. Second, uh, it's imp partnerships are important because no single agency will be able to do this alone. And the, the work that, that uh, uh, you have started at the African Development Bank under Mr. Adesina's leadership is crucial because you are creating a platform where all of us, whether from the foundation world, from the uh, sort of IFIs, DFIs, uh, you know, are all working and AGRA are working together towards the same objective. I think this is extremely, you know, it's sine qua non. We can't do it uh, without that. And, and fourth, uh, I think it's, uh, we need to look also beyond Africa to learn experiences. Uh, Asia has made amazing strides in this area. And we have to have an open mind and really invite um, those success stories from Asia and other parts in Latin America uh, to, to bring them for, to Africa and China. You know, I, I think all of these uh, countries and regions have a lot of lessons to offer that we need to bring in and learn from and benefit from. So um, this is why, I mean, and, and this is why we are uh, involved in the TAT program. And uh, just uh, in terms of the, the specific support that we are bringing, we are envisaging this current fiscal year, we were envisaging uh, uh, contributions of about $500 million to programs in Africa, which were in line with the TAT program. And I'm happy to say that we have revisited our numbers and we believe that this year we will be able to uh, implement $700 million of projects in, uh, in, the, in the tax sector. So, so uh, we're with you and, uh, and we look forward to, to continuing this uh, and extending this collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's excellent. And I think, um, 
You know, if you look also at the opportunity, um, by some estimates, the agriculture sector will represent um, a market of about one trillion by 2030. So I think clearly that's why we're basing our Feed Africa strategy very much on a lot of the things that you were talking about. Um, because it's a big challenge when you look at the, at the imports, the net imports, but also a massive opportunity if we do the right things. And we tend to look at it in two pillars. You have to increase the productivity and then you have to move up the value chain. And so this is very much about you know, the increasing the productivity, producing more in, in a smaller space uh, so that we can, we can uh, really reap the benefits. So Agnes, turning to you. Uh, moving on down the line, and obviously this is kind of your bread and butter, uh, and why I think you were probably even, you know, after the World Bank, uh, the next partner that, that came in and said that, that you guys were keen to work uh, together closely on this. Um, you know, the Agra Input Dealer Network has grown across the continent over the years, and that can be a really important uh, basis for all of this. How do you see TAT working with the Agro Dealer Networks? Uh, to reach the tens of millions of farmers with modern technology, because if we don't get this out to them, then it will be sort of a moot point. So how do you see that happening? Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I'm very excited about the launch of the TAT and the fact that IITA is involved. IITA was my first job, and I worked at IITA till after my, my PhD. So I left IITA to go to government. But the, for me, the excitement then comes from that, the link between what I learned at IITA and then what I got to know in government. I got to understand that there are so many technologies out there, so many good people out there in CG centers, and there was so little on the side of government in terms of the technology flow, but also in terms of the capacity support that governments needed to be able to drive what they were doing. So for me, it's very critical that we have a place where technologies are looked at and these technologies are passed to the people that need them the most. Yesterday, and I'll keep saying it, I talked about the, the zinc rice. I just can't believe that that zinc rice is not on the plates of farmers that need them. So TAT really does present that opportunity. Now, the, the agro dealership model started by the Rockefeller Foundation in 1997. <laughs> Uh, an Indian uh, business person say, thought about how they could get these pumps, irrigation pumps, to, to smallholder farmers in India. And that has since taken off. And, and uh, when Akin was at Agra, definitely really put a lot of effort in pushing and showing that these agro dealerships were developed to actually take seeds and farmers and, and fertilizers to farmers. So it's become a very important model of how we do business. Now, what, what TAT is going to have to do is to work with governments, right? To work with, we have lots of national institutions that are waiting for these technologies, to work with governments to ensure that the technologies become available, that the technologies are ready to go, become available at country level, and, and that there's information, right? That there's information that actually when agro dealerships, these businesses get the technologies, they know what to do, and they become the proper extension agents that they need to be. So there's a lot of information that get to be passed around at that point. These people are extremely important. They put capital on the table. They put their, their own big stakes on the table. They put capital on the table. They connect farmers to businesses in ways that, in, in places where there's no infrastructure. They know what, is, what technology is working and what technology is not working. So they're your really biggest line of how to get to farmers. And they're the most important people in, in the value chain. So I think that ensuring that they have the right level of knowledge and ensuring that they get the flow of technologies that they need because they are business people that they need is going to be very important. Right now as Agro, we are focusing mostly on two things, strengthening systems, end to end. See if you're looking at seed, how's the seed system working from the time a seed leaves a research institution to when the time the seed gets to the farmer. And we would welcome working with TAT on, on that to ensure that, that these varieties get to the farmers faster. We are also working with governments so that governments actually look at the type of big programs that they want to drive and prioritize those programs and look at what is going to be impactful 
right? What is going to be impactful in terms of driving agriculture? What is going to be transformative? And again, we welcome working with Tato on that. But again, really ensuring that the agro dealership where they are sitting is making a business. It's a business, uh, as Akin always says. This is going to be a business. And the only way we can get these technologies to farmers is if there's value at that end of the business. Thank you. So let us not forget our mantra, which is agriculture as a business, not a way of life, right? As we roll this out, it's true. And the president does keep talking about the fact that the private sector role in this will be critical if it's going to be sustainable. And I think we know that that's true, I think, throughout everything that we're trying to do in, in this sphere. So Raj, turning to you, least, uh, last but not least. Um, so, you know, given all of the agricultural activities that Rockefeller has been sort of carrying out and involved in over the years, um, as well as your central role in the green revolutions that have taken place in the past. And actually, if you look at the document that we prepared for our board, we're very much putting it in a historical perspective. And clearly, you know, your role has been, has been so central in this. Um, you know, how would you or your foundation particularly like to see this uh, rolled out uh, for maximum impact uh, in order to really get the technologies where they need to go, given that you have such long-standing experience in this area? Well, uh, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you uh, for having me here. I am honored to be with uh, real Rockefeller leaders like Akeen and, and Gordon and others, and, and won't yet pretend that I can speak on behalf of that really powerful history, especially in, in this room. Uh, but I do want to make a few comments about the point you raised. Uh, you know, it would be easy to come into this room and believe that the world is angry and divisive that assistance levels for the priorities we care about are diminishing, uh, and that it's hard enough to keep our politics together for any responsible engagement around the world, much less uh, an ambition that is so bold that it's designed to truly see through to the final success, the next green revolution in Africa. And so I think it is special and important that we all come here uh, with that bold aspiration at a time when the world desperately needs success stories for global cooperation designed to help lift people up, not put them down. And in that context, I think there are three reasons I'm very uh, excited and want to be all in on this effort and this vision forward. Uh, the first is this is an African-led vision. As, as Akeem uh, and others know, in 2003, Kofi Annan, with your leadership, brought people together in Maputo, brought the African heads of state together. This is now 15 years almost after that. And we have a very concrete, very specific vision led by a uh, president of the African Development Bank. I want you all to appreciate how unique it is uh, that the president of the African Development Bank just defined the nation state as a bunch of lines and borders that split up agroecological zones. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, that's fairly unique, and we should take advantage of having such a committed agronomist in this role to, to change the world. Uh, but we also have Agra, and we have more than a decade of effort of building, uh, I would argue, the premier institution technically on the ground in Africa, reaching 15 million farm households, putting all these new seed varieties there. It's no longer safe to say that we don't know how to get this done because Agnes has done it in government, Agnes has done it in a public-private partnership. The team she leads and the networks they represent uh, have worked with all of you to deliver practical outcomes that we can measure and report on. And, and we have the African heads of state that have backed this vision for years and years and years. So now we have powerful, unique African leadership that it is our duty to all get behind. Second, we actually have an important opportunity uh, in the United States. You know, Mark Green is a special leader, and it made me really proud to see him wear the USAID uh, lapel, a uh, logo on his lapel today, because, you know, this is tough politics in America. And American leadership on food and hunger most crystallized by Dr. Borlaug and by uh, this state in many ways uh, is so powerful, but it is at threat. And the fact that Mark Green is saying, I'm going to fight for Feed the Future, I'm going to fight for America's role in the world, 
I'm going to fight for uh, our efforts to, to be part of these efforts. I want to do it in partnership. And I got your back means a lot. And I think we all in this room owe it to ourselves to find ways to partner with and support. They could be public-private partnerships or otherwise uh, mark at this unique point in time. The politics he has to deal with are a lot tougher than the politics I had to deal with. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, but but I, saw, I, saw the power, I saw the power of conservative Republicans holding hands with liberal Democrats to say, let's project America's leadership around the world for good and on behalf of the vulnerable, and let's do it with passion and commitment and faith and partnership. And you heard all that from Mark today. So, so that's the second task at hand is we got to get behind uh, a vision of engagement that is positive and effective. And the third, and, and by the way, that includes Nick Yu, because the Gates Foundation is easily the largest funder of agricultural development in the private philanthropic space. And, uh, you know, Bill, Bill used to say that he started Microsoft during a recession. In the same way, you have the opportunity, I think, to reimagine the future of your engagement in agricultural development during a period of time when folks wonder what American leadership is going to look like. Uh, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, we have a set of results here that we can be concrete and specific about. 120 million metric tons of additional production. 40 million people moved out of poverty. Country by country, a set of concrete outcomes for getting varieties into the hands of smallholders and the yield impacts that that means and the impact on women's incomes that that then uh, results in. And we have a discipline now about measuring and reporting on those results. So, I think we have to maintain that. I think we have to come back here every year, uh, and uh, Ken will commit ourselves to doing that, to come back every year. But we got to report on the results. How much more progress have we made year after year after year? Because people have to see and believe that we can get there. So, so we're all in. We will do whatever we can at Rockefeller to support uh, a vision and a community and a set of partners that have been at this for a long time. But this is a unique point in time, and I think if we can show the world we can do something wildly positive and impactful at a time when people wonder what the future of globalization looks like, we will have done something even more powerful than our core objectives. Thanks, Raj. So we will task ourselves to work together well in the sandbox and also measure what we do. Uh, and I mean, I would, I would even say, you know, I hope that this is, we work together a lot on many, in many different areas, but, you know, in terms of your call to arms, you know, let us make sure that this is going to be the business, the way we do business together in the future. Um, we have a lot of people, I'm sure, in the room who are uh, maybe surprised, excited, interested uh, by the fact that all of us have come together for such a big initiative to get the latest technologies to Africa's farmers, uh, and to do it quickly and at scale. Uh, let me open up to the floor for any comments or questions. Uh, if there's anyone who has a burning, and I believe that there are microphones here, so if you get in line, uh, you can go ahead and get in line, and then, and I believe that there's one over there as well. Uh, so please, and introduce yourself. Uh, and, uh, and then ask away. And let us know if there's someone in particular that you have the question for. Please. All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Chibiki Emmanuel. I'm from Nigeria. Congratulations, President. Um, it's really an honor to be here. I'm a farmer, so and I am a former participant that was specially invited for this occasion. Um, you, talked, uh, you talked about tact and you talked about bringing a lot of um, development partners to the table to buy in. My question is, are you developing or do you have a master plan for engaging the youth, the African youth, and explaining tact to them? Because I believe that when they understand fully, that is their future that we are talking about here, if they understand, they can pressure um, policymakers to take the technology from shelves and put it to plate. That's, that's the first thing. Secondly, this one is a comment. Usually when we talk about smallholder farmers in Africa, 
we still have the picture of old women and old men farming in villages. That demography is changing. And I'm, I, I think that our strategies will be to engage the increasing number of young people that are entering um, the farming sector because they are educated and if they understand everything that is happening, they can better drive policies and engage um, their leaders to make better choices for them. Thank you. Maybe I'll just start quickly uh, to answer that one and then see if, if, if you would like to answer. We, as you probably know, we have a big effort. I, if you look at, at our Feed Africa strategy, at least at, at the African Development Bank, uh, we have a number of efforts that sort of um, come together uh, to create a whole uh, of addressing many of the different challenges and also those things that would strengthen uh, the agriculture sector uh, in Africa. And one of them is called Enable Youth. And we had a big event, side event, all morning yesterday uh, to really look at that. Uh, and this is about taking young graduates and getting them excited about agriculture, teaching them how to do business plans and really training them up and then also getting them the financing that they need to to build or, or start their businesses. Um, and so I say certainly, you know, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we make sure that there are synergies between everything that we do. And I think TAT and, and Enable and all these things will be of a piece. Uh, that's certainly true uh, in our own area. I don't know if, Mr. President, you would like to add anything to that. Well, I just, I just wanted to say that um, you're absolutely right. You know, we, we have to very quickly change the labor composition of the agricultural sector because the, the average age of farmers in, in Africa today is probably about 60, 65. So in another 20 years, we may not have farmers left if we don't start right now. And, and so which means we have to change the perceptions of young people in agriculture. We have to make them to understand that agriculture is a wealth making sector. It's not a sector for managing poverty. Uh, it's a sector for creating wealth. And I'm delighted there's so many young people uh, in this hall today and all week uh, that I hear about that message. That's a very, very important message, you know. And um, I think that's why the, the, the bank, uh, we put in uh, last year almost close to $800 million uh, to support young people, creating a new generation of young entrepreneurial dynamic guys and uh, getting into agriculture. Um, and we hope to do, I think over the next 10 years, probably an average of $1.5 billion a year, supporting young people in, 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 in agriculture. And we're also trying to create some venture uh, private equity funds that will actually allow them to not only have great ideas, but also grow their businesses. You know, we want, we want these guys to be the future millionaires and billionaires of Africa coming out of agriculture. You know, and so that's, I think that's very important uh, a, a thing to, uh, 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 to look at. The other thing I wanted to say is that when we talk about the issue of young people, uh, we always like to talk at the same time about what the bank is doing to support women uh, uh, in agriculture. You know. Um, where would we all be without women? We would be nowhere, you know. And, um, you know, and I, <laughs> you know, I, I try to look for birds. I'm still looking for a bird that have, has only one wing. Every bird has two wings. And so <laughs> Africa will move much faster. And you have great, faster, inclusive growth if you actually accelerate access of financing to women and ensuring access to property rights for women. And, and, and this, is, this is why at the bank, we've actually launched a major effort uh, that is called Affirmative Finance Action for Women, uh, which is to mobilize $3 billion of support for women businesses alone in Africa. Wait for a man, I'm sorry, we can't help you right now, uh, <laughs> but maybe later. Uh, but I know the World Bank also, Jim Kim also has a great program that she's doing with uh, Ivanka Trump also uh, you know, in supporting women. So I think we've got to get youth and women right. Anybody want to weigh in on that? Yes, maybe just uh, just a point on, uh, uh, you know, uh, the World Bank is full of economists. I'm not one of those, but, you know, I keep hearing every day that I go to work about incentives and how incentives work. And, uh, and I think that uh, it's important to build the right incentives for youth, for, for get, to give more access to, you, for, to all this financing to the youth. And uh, I think targeted subsidies are, are important for youth, for women, for refugees, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And so the 
policy angle is important, uh, but also this value chain, uh, you know, the work on value chains and bringing, you know, credit to SMEs and it's, it, these are cliche words that we use in every, uh, in every uh, uh, statement that it's important to grow SMEs, but without that, you're not going to be able to bring all the youth in. So it's really important to, uh, to involve them and interest them into creating businesses around agriculture. Next. I just wanted to add that um, during the recently concluded AGRF that was in, in uh, Ivory Coast, you were there, Jennifer. Um, one of the things we did for the first time was to organize youth, actually in Ivory Coast, but also in five other countries where Strive, our board chair, actually engaged the youth in each country for about one hour, had discussions, really trying to inspire them around what is possible and how to use the, uh, the whole idea of, and the opportunity that the telephone system now creates and how to create businesses as young people today. The biggest thing at the AGRF specifically that was very interesting were the fact that uh, young people who had ideas had an opportunity to compete. We had a whole day of, of competition where good ideas were actually had funders. So that was something new that we did, where uh, ideas were being matched, matched by people who had the, the, the possibility to fund them. So I think that if we continue growing this, but also look at where technology is taking us and the opportunities are presenting, especially in agriculture, there's a real opportunity to, to engage young people. The one that I like the most, of course, is the Uber tractor that we are now using in Nairobi and, and that Agra is, is, is funding in a number of countries. Thank you. Thanks. Now, I just noticed that we're very popular. There's lots of people who want to ask questions. So maybe I'll take a few at a time. Maybe um, we'll take, we'll go back and forth, uh, maybe take four or so, and then we'll, we'll go back to the panel. So please. Thank you. Um, I'm John Magnay from Opportunity International. Um, I see a lot of uh, unit, unity amongst the development partners and also the private sector. The challenge I think we all have is that we need to get unification in political leadership across Africa because they are the ones who are going to uh, make the policies and drive the legislations that will allow this to happen. And that's the area that I think I'm most concerned about. And I, w I wonder how we're going to uh, tackle that particular challenge. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you very much for our distinguished panelists. Um, I don't know if the audience paid attention, but last night at the, govern uh, at the governor's reception, in one of the rooms there was the name Ibn Awa. And I was amazed to see that name there. It's one of the first uh, agronomists worldwide from Africa who uh, published one of the biggest book on agricultural history and in Andalusia. So I was very happy to see that name on, on in the room. The reason I'm saying this is the crucial importance of technology has always has started in Africa and people believe in it. Just go to the Library of Alexandria or Timbuktu Library and you will find the, the evidence about that. My question is the following. What are the limitations of our distinguished panelists? What are the aspects of their intervention that they wish they could handle in order to have their future projects successful? Second question, the World Bank issued a report in 2012 saying that one of the main reasons of our failure in many projects is the late inclusion of social scientists, anthropologists. The, the most evident example, think of the so-called Arab Spring that started in North Africa, the Azawad movement in Mali, and those countries witnessed huge investments but then these cultural transformations took place that tended to sweep away a lot of those investments. So how do you see integrating that? Okay, thanks. We'll take two more questions right now. And please, can we keep them short and only one question per? <laughs> please, thanks. <laughs> My name is Phil Villas. I'm president of Grain Pro. And my question has to do with the issue of bringing to scale, which this panel emphasized. If you look at the food chain and the green revolution, what is the neglected part of that food chain? I would propose strongly that it is storage 
which comes between production and consumption. And the problem of bringing to scale available technology which can reduce losses to less than 1% per year in storage is there. The fight against aflatoxins which grow like crazy in hot climates can be eliminated also by appropriate technology without the use of pesticides. And my question, with the possible exception of the Gates Foundation, which has done very important work on the front end of storage, why is this the neglected part of the food chain improvement? Yeah. And one more on this side, and then we'll go back to the panel, please. <coughs> I'm Andrew Manu from Ghana. I want to ask a question about the involvement, this partnership that you talk about today. I think there are so many countries who have prospered in so many areas because of the diaspora, the impact of diaspora. And I think we come here to learn things. We go to Europe to learn things and we don't want it to stay with us. We want to go home and help. What is any policy that has been developed by the bank or any other organization to involve uh, the, the diaspora in terms of agricultural development? Because uh, people are doing great work over all over the world uh, in terms of diaspora. And I wanted to know if there's been a concerted effort to uh, <clears throat> make it a standard thing to do to involve the diaspora. Thank you. Okay, so let's turn back. Uh, that was a large variety of questions. If I can summarize, one is great to see unity uh, among the donors, but what about among leaders? Uh, second was things like bringing in social scientists. Third was um, what is the role of storage and why is it neglected? And the fourth was what could be the role of the diaspora? Would anyone like to take any of those or all of those? Agnes? Yeah. I guess I'll talk about two, the, the leadership part, that the question that was asked, and then the storage part. Now, earlier on I was talking to you about how being, being in government, I definitely did recognize uh, how we were suffering with lack of technology that we already were already there. One of the things that we, we want to work on now as Agra, we've started working on, is really the issue of state capacity in driving agricultural development. We do recognize that countries, like I said earlier, are struggling with having the right capacities to define some of the challenges they're dealing with, to write some of those programs, and African Development Bank, and you have uh, PPFs and things like that that help countries to support, to, to support them to write these programs. But we want to institutionalize those. We want to ensure that the countries we work with have the capacity to provide the leadership that partners are looking for, whether it's African Development <coughs> Bank, whether it is World Bank and other institutions. We want them to own their problems. So what we are doing now as an African institution, we are actually working and ensuring that we provide the capacity we provide the reviews they want. We also help build their data and analytics department so that they can actually start understanding the planning process that is behind uh, driving and building appropriate agricultural sectors. But we also want accountability. We want them to understand that in the real world, the accountable system that we all must work with. And so uh, having these discussions, being accountable, to the communities that they work for, but also being accountable to the people that give them resources is very critical in mobilizing further resources. So as an institution, we're actually mostly focusing on <laughs> driving and building country leadership and really helping them have a, a very good partnership. We are also looking at how we can help them build better partnerships with the development community that they work with, because sometimes it's also a challenge. So that's an area that Agra has decided to focus on. And that's an area, many of our development partners, um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and USAID have recognized as a critical area. USAID has been leading in this space through the Africa Lead for some time. And they've understood the challenges that countries are facing. So that's why we formed the Piata Partnership, so that we can help drive leadership at country level. And we as Agra take that responsibility very seriously because we are, the, the, on one hand, we are the suffering end. These are people we wake up every day and see 
the children that have no food, the children that are hungry, that we have something to do about. And we know that there are technologies in the world that we can, we can get to them. So that's the third idea again, really helps us ground this. So I wanted to talk about that leadership part. That's why we've really shifted our, our strategy to focus on how we can help drive Africa's leadership. The part on, on, on post-harvest losses, I appreciate the comment, and yesterday we had a meeting, I had a meeting with a gentleman who is asking, um, Africa loses over 40, th between 30 and 45 percent of the crop that we produce. So if we just saved that, we probably would do very well without doing much more. So, so there's a lot that is being done. The gentleman that is asking works with us. He thinks it's being done by BMGF Foundation, by BMGF, but it's actually work we are doing with Local Fair Foundation through the YieldWise program. So I wanted to emphasize, Bill and Amanda Gates Foundation is supporting us, especially in um, driving technologies and all the way from breeding to markets, and Local Fair Foundation is, is supporting Agra through, um, through the YieldWise, which is a, a program that is focused on reducing post-service technologies, but also supporting the private sector to come up with post-service technology solutions. We work, again, on that stream of business. We work with USAID to build seed companies. So we have three major partners, and this time we are really partnering on um, focusing on building state capacity for agriculture. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, just on the, on the point of political... Uh, leadership. I think once we, once we talk about political leadership, we kind of assume that political leadership means a president, uh, it means a vice president, and things like that. No. no. We are the political leaders. We are the leaders, actually. You know, leaders are found in every side. You have leaders in research, you have leaders, farmer leaders, you have community leaders, and so on. So we have to begin to look at the concept of leadership in a much, apart from that, very hierarchical uh, I think it's a collective leadership that we actually need uh, a lot more in Africa. When I look at the issue today that will make the leadership to pay attention to agriculture, um, you know, you look at Africa today, we have a problem with terrorism in many parts of Africa. But in my view, I, I feel that part of the problem is what I call this uh, triangle of disaster. You've got three factors. Whenever you have them, you always have terrorists. You have high level of rural employment, especially among the youth, extreme rural poverty, and areas you have high levels of climate and environmental degradation. Anywhere you find those areas, whether it's in Lake Chad Basin, whether it's in northern Kenya, whether it's in northern Mali, you've got terrorists always operating. I think what we've got to really do is to see the power of agriculture to transform rural economies from zones of economic misery to zones of economic prosperity. And I think that's what political leaders in particular have to pay a lot of attention to. Personally, I don't think we can solve the problem of insecurity in many parts of Africa uh, just by Apache helicopters. That's not how you're going to solve that problem. We've got to really go in there and make sure we create a lot of opportunities uh, for, uh, uh, for young people. That's another reason why leaders are paying a lot of attention to, uh, to agriculture today, and that's because of the, of the youth board. In fact, that what you were saying about you know, the high level of youth unemployment that you have, and you have a lot of young people in the rural areas that can do so much. And they are going to put everybody's feet up on the, uh, on the fire to make sure we can create economic uh, opportunities uh, uh, for them. And I think that when we also talk about getting agriculture working, we need collective action by farmers. You know, if you are, I'm, we're sitting here right here in, our, in Des Moines. I understand you can't be president of the United States if you don't win uh, in, uh, in Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> But how come uh, leaders win in Africa? Uh, they go to rural areas, you campaign, and after that you forget about them. Yet if you're in France, uh, if you do anything against farmers, they will take all their tractors and all the manures of their farm, everything is on the, uh, on the... So what I'm trying to say is, I'm not, I'm not saying let's organize against government. <laughs> um, I'm just saying that we need very strong farmer institutions that can actually hold government accountable for what they actually said they are going to do. And I think that, the, that we should organize farmers to be able to have political voice. And I think when you have political voice, you get leaders actually listening to you quite a lot. Um, I want to also say something about the storage part, and I think Agnes uh, was saying that. Two points I just wanted to make is, you know, when Phil Nelson and, uh, you know, got the World Food Prize, it was for actually doing exactly that. 
which is to help to reduce a lot of the work, uh, the post harvest losses. We have the hermetic bags that are developed by Purdue University. Of course, I'm making a big pitch for Purdue because I'm, a, I'm an art guy from Purdue, of course. Uh, but uh, the hermetic bags are great uh, to reduce losses, in particular for cowpeas uh, and things like that. IITA has a fantastic technology, which is Aflasafe. And the Aflasafe actually reduces aflatoxin actually in, uh, in maize by almost about, and granules by almost 99.9%. And so again, back to the TAT technologies, how do, we, how do we take those kind of things uh, to scale? And I know Gates Foundation uh, actually supported a lot of work. You were there uh, at Gates uh, at, at that time. And the last thing I just want to say on the diaspora uh, side um, is that I think that today in Africa, you get a lot of diaspora coming in. They have commercial farms. Uh, diaspora remittances are very, very important for households in Africa. And we have to find a way in which we take those remittances and try to um, make sure we can use them, not just for consumption, uh, but to securitize them and so that we can use them for investment in energy and infrastructure that Africa needs. So I agree with you. China has a great program uh, that's called the uh, China Bridging Program, where they bring in scientists and world leading institutions back to China for a couple of months. And I think in Africa, we're looking forward to being able to do something like that, the bridge program. To, it's, not a, it's not a, what do you call it? It's not a uh, brain, brain law, what is it? It's not a brain drain, uh, it's actually a brain gain for us. So we want to tap into that. Great. Thanks. And just, uh, there are five people who have been waiting, and I want to make sure that you each have a chance. But please, very briefly, we'll go to each, because we have five minutes left. Each, like, you know, 20 seconds each with your comments, and then we'll try to get a few last comments from the first. So please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kwesi Atakra, and I am with IITA. Um, I can sense the excitement in this, in this room from what we have heard from the distinguished panelists. And I just want the panelists to help me here. I'm trying to identify three key words which cut across what they have given to us. And the first word that comes to my mind is the word transformation. That agriculture now has to be transformative. And we need to make sure whatever we are doing is leading to enhancement of benefits and livelihoods in the places. The second what I hear is the word alignment, that we have to be aligned to the big goals, the excitement that is being created, and also alignment to country strategic agendas, that we can be working through countries to achieve what the big vision wants to do. And then the third word is the word integration that we can't do things just by ourselves, and we have to figure out. And I just want to throw these three words to the panelists and see if they agree or disagree. Thanks. Thank you. Hard to disagree with those three. <laughs> Please. Um, I'm Tobela from the, I'm Tobela Ngukwena from South Africa. I work for the University of Pretoria as a lecturer. Um, happy to have a developmental bank president who is so motivated and sees potential in what can happen in Africa. But I think we need to move beyond that. We need to move beyond potential. For many years, Africa has had potential and it has been, it has been spoken of. But we keep continu continuously, perpetually, we fail to deliver and we fail to meet our potential. We continuously um, take for granted knowledge economy that has already been generated, that is already there for use. Um, technology is not new. Technology in agriculture has been there. In South Africa, we have consolidated, vertically integrated system, agricultural system that are working effectively. But the failure to take those to small scale farmers, I don't know where we're failing, but if Brazil can collectively, amongst small-scale producers, um, constitute um, cooperatives that are able, at the end of the day, to imp export to Africa, then there's a problem, either with our statesmen or with what we're doing as developmental agents in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think that that's really the goal of TAT. Um, so please. 
Nabiha Kazi, President and CEO of Humanitas Global and Chair of the Community for Zero Hunger. Akeen, last year at a meeting, you had a brilliant statement that stayed with me. It was, Africa's development will come from within Africa, not from outside Africa. And my question is for both you and Agnes, as both of you are really leading that charge and, and driving the agenda and what is possible. Who from within Africa, again, both for Akeen and, and Agnes, who from within Africa is not at the table, who needs to be at the table? And what issues are being overlooked by the donor community that need to be prioritized? Thank you. Please, quickly. Heyman here. I have handled a seed systems project in Kasawa in Nigeria. Uh, hats off to the uh, convening power of uh, World Food Prize. This is the most powerful panel that I have uh, experienced in my life so far. So, <laughs> so, well, so uh, we say involving youth in solving the demographic problems of Africa is a given. Uh, in that, as uh, Dr. Adisina said, the times have changed. In my mind, initially we said give them fish, but then we said that time has gone, teach them fishing. But I think that time also has gone, and now we need to set up a fishing industry, because if we teach fishing, we can teach them only so far as what we know. But if we set up the fishing industry, let somebody do the um, eggs, some, let somebody do the processing, let somebody come up with new nets and all that. So ex-Prime Minister, ex Minister of India used to say, I want to see the animal spirits in the industry. So how can we, with the powerful people that we are talking about, with the big guns here, how can we set up the, unleash the power of youth coming out? That would be more powerful than empowering few people. Empowering few people is good to get the oasis happening but unleashing the whole power would be more powerful, I think. Thank you. The ultimately not giving the fish, but teaching to fish all along the value chain. And the last question, please. Pam Johnson, farmer from Iowa. And I want to offer the voice of farmers collectively to help turn this wheel. It inspires me. I see the need. And I'm president of Maisal, an international alliance of corn growers from Argentina and Brazil and the US. And we are pledged to have agriculture without borders so that farmers, small and large, have access to technology and there are good government policies to allow that to happen. And especially now with Uganda adopting the new biosafety protocol law, we would like to be able to offer our services to help carry on that mission. So thank you for your panel. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so in the last very, very brief minutes that we have, I think two perhaps, if I could just go along and just ask each of you to, to say a few words, um, you know, ideally responding a little bit to what you heard and also any final thoughts that you have for the room and, and how we can work uh, very effectively together. Please, Thank, Nick. Thanks, Jennifer. Brief, uh, brief response and thoughts. Just firstly in relation to Quesi's three proposals, I think transformation, alignment, and integration can't argue with those. I just wanted to pick up on the transformation piece and emphasize the importance of the inclusive nature of that transformation. We know and we are seeing uh, agricultural economies transforming. There are different paths for that transformation. To be inclusive requires deliberate actions. We've talked already on the panel and in the sessions prior around the importance of women and girls, importance of reaching uh, those harder to reach, further from markets, further from infrastructure. So just to really emphasize that inclusive inclusivity on this trajectory uh, to agricultural and economic transformation as we see the rise of medium farms and the like. The other, I think, very briefly aspect that hasn't come up but is re relevant to a number of the questions in the Africa-led national capacities of agricultural research and extension systems. Uh, to enable technologies to be made locally relevant and to continue to drive progress, drawing on the best practices. Um, I'll just, it's back. <laughs> Thank you. But recognising that Asia's transformation journey is a very different one to Africa's given the agroecologies and the local context, so that patient investment in national capacities in extension, uh, not in ways of the past, but in exciting new ways incorporating digital to get new knowledge and, and products to farmers. 
Uh, no, yes. Uh, I just, um, you know, uh, some of the questions uh, made me think that really we may be looking at agriculture as a narrow sector. And it is not. It is really a theme. It is not a, you know, something that you can just look at one narrow way. You need to look at markets. You need to look at, you know, how to bring in youth, how to make it inclusive. And uh, the question on the social scientist, I think, uh, sort of connects with this because you really need to look at things, uh, bring different uh, strands uh, into it to succeed. Otherwise, by looking purely at the sort of fertilizer, entrance, you know, the, the very narrow agricultural issues, we're not going to be able to make it. We have to look at it more broadly and we have to bring in uh, those other sectors to support it. I just wanted to mention the, 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 the parts that is missing for me when you said transformation alignment and uh, integration is partnerships. So assuming that that was implied as well, because one thing we have learned is there's so many of us there that are trying to do the right thing, but we really need to align our efforts. We need to integrate our efforts. We need to make sure that we are adding up. So I think that's a very critical part of where we are going. If we are going to get a transformation for, this, for the African continent, especially where I'm from, we really need to align our efforts and be, work as partners in, the, in, this, in this perspective. The question on, um, that was specifically addressed to me on um, who is missing at the table here, who I would like to be around is actually, a, for example, a Minister of Agriculture. It would have been nice to have a Minister of Agriculture on this table discussing with us what we are talking about. Because many times, I can't tell you how many times I sat on the other side and I thought that these guys missed the point. They don't get it. Because I had my ideas of what I wanted done, and I'm sure Akin also had, had, had that impression sometimes. So it's very important that the clients that we talk about, the people we are looking to support, the governments we are talking about, the, their views also get heard. And I'm sure many of us, uh, represent that in a way because we care about what happens there. I'm happy that there are a number of farmer voices in the, in, the, in the audience, but those two voices are very critical. Those are the people we serve. The governments that are trying to do everything they can for their people and the people that actually depend, whose livelihoods depend on what we do. Thank you. I'll just pick up where Agnes left off in terms of people that could be included in this conversation. The first group, in my view, ought to be people who represent patient private capital. There's, uh, Akeen has made the case loudly that agriculture needs to be seen as a commercial business and a commercial investment opportunity. But there have been very few successful agricultural transformations that exclude real private investment. And in a world where uh, we see billionaires investing in long-term enterprises to, put, uh, to get, make space travel or hyperloop travel m more possible, uh, it seems like we should be able to tap into big pools of capital to be patient and focused in bringing the technology transformation to African agriculture. The second community of, of leaders I'd love to have in this discussion are mobile phone operators and those that really do capture the consumer behavior data of, uh, of these rural households. Uh, I think we live in a world where data itself is going to be extraordinarily valuable. And even the poorest rural family generates information about when they use power, how they move around, when they connect with others, and for what purpose. And in the spirit of those 30-year-old uh, studies the World Bank used to do on understanding the lives of the communities you try to serve, the, the modern interpretation of that is probably big data and machine learning applied to uh, aggregated information about the lives of the billion or two billion people that still live in some form of extreme poverty. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, to, to thank the um, representative of the, of the Farmers Association that just spoke over there. I think what you find us really talking about here, I like the, the time you use that, looking at agriculture without borders. And in fact, what we're talking about, Tat, is really that technology without borders uh, in, in Africa. I think that's very important. So we can have technologies without borders. We can have innovations without borders. But we also need partnership without borders. You know? And I think that ability to learn from different parts of the world and what works 
and what didn't work and how do we adapt is very important. That's why I was very delighted with the conversation we had with Embrapa and with uh, the Argentinians and so on about uh, the, their successes in actually the Cerrados uh, of Brazil and how those Cerrados aren't that much, in fact, our savannas are better than the Cerrados of Brazil and how they were able to unlock their potential and we are sitting on ours and to your point, nobody, Dr. Bullock said it all the time, uh, you know, if you, if you like uh, potential, he hasn't seen it yet on the menu, you, nobody eats it, you know, so we've got to really make sure that we unlock this. My mother taught me something which I never forgot, that if you're trying to sweep, you have a broom and you have different strands of it, and you can either use those little sticks, strands of it to sweep, of course, I mean to sweep, you will not succeed. But if you took all the strands together, and you, 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 you know, wrap them all together, and you try to sweep, it, it works. It's like a vacuum cleaner, at least when I was growing up, that was our own vacuum cleaner. Uh, uh, you know, and so what you have here is uh, the power of partnerships. I think partnerships is the way to go. You know, I have absolutely no interest in planting any plugs. Nobody eats them, you know, but we want to work together to make sure that we can transform the lives of people together and really lift millions of people out of poverty. I'm going to end on the point that Raj made on the issue of private sector because Raj is absolutely correct. And that's why for us at the African Development Bank, we're also launching uh, this, this next year what is called the Africa Investment Forum to try to harness exactly the global pension funds, uh, the sovereign wealth funds, the institutional investors and similar ones in Africa to invest in agriculture, to invest in rural energy, in renewable energy, uh, in logistic chains and things like that, and warehousing and things that we need. And just to let you know that, you know, we think that we must have strong public-private partnerships for the technologies for African transformation uh, 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 to, to actually work. So I want to thank Raj, I want to thank Agnes for your leadership, thank the World Bank and thank uh, Unique and also Bill and Melinda Gates for their very strong support. Of course, I have a very capable vice president. She will make it all happen. So thank you very much. What else is there to say? I think it's all been said. Um, now we will go forth and prosper. Uh, carpe diem. Uh, and as, uh, as we said, we will come back next year and we will tell you what we've achieved. And we are planning to achieve things quickly. So thank you very much uh, and uh, thank you to the panel and we wish you a great rest of, of your day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Sorry, uh, before you all go, I, I want the dean of our board who's been listening very well to get up and uh, be recognized. He's going to also help us a lot. Dean, thank you. <laughs> Okay, can I, that was a very influential panel, but there's another influential panel coming up right now. Perhaps I can get uh, Joachim and Usman, Gabisa, Natalila, and Stefan. make sure we don't can you please settle down this is another great panel just about to start
Can I please have your attention? That was a great panel we've just heard. This is another outstanding panel. And when you've settled down, please, we can start. Good. This panel is composed of both Europeans and Americans and Africans. It's a unique group of people who've come together here. In many ways, as equally powerful as the people we've been listening to on the panel just now. We have uh, Stefan Schmidt at the far end, who uh, has a long career in the German government, German federal government, and recently, well, I think it was about three years ago, launched the great program on One World, No Hunger. Next to him is Natalila Nkombe, who has worked in NGOs of various kinds and now is the director of the One Campaign. Next to her is Gabise Jetta, who uh, is Ethiopian, of course, but is a great plant breeder, breeder of sorghum based in, in Purdue. We always hear a lot about Purdue. <laughs> then Usman Bajan, who uh, was um, uh, also trained in, 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 in Germany uh, and uh, is now the director of IFPRI based in, in Africa. And, and finally, Joachim von Braun, next to me here, who uh, was, as many of you know, the director of IFPRI and um, is now running a, a, a great research uh, department at, at Bonn University and has recently been uh, elected as the president of the Pontifical Academy. You can't get much higher than that. Well, you can, but that would depose the Pope, I think. Yes, that's right. Um, and uh, I should also just add that many of the people on the panel are also members of the new Malibu Montpellier panel, and there are other people who are part of that new panel in the audience. And if you want to know what it does, you just look up on the web Malibu Montpellier panel. I'll hand over to Joachim now to run this discussion. Thank you, Joachim. Thank you so much, Gordon, uh, for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, Gordon is a member of the Malabo Montpellier panel. He humbly hid that from you. Um, I'm very pleased to moderate this uh, panel. And um, uh, let me underline that um, this is uh, an international panel focused on food and agriculture and with a particular emphasis on nutrition. Um, in the end, agriculture is uh, to improve uh, people's livelihood, their satisfaction with life, and that very much depends on nutrition. So talking about agriculture is not enough. Uh, we have to uh, go for the additional, not last mile, these are several miles to transform uh, the uh, market and production um, and uh, public services systems into good nutrition outcomes. It is um, 12 years ago that some of us were together in um, a conference which we co-organized, um, which we organized by IFPRI in Kampala, Uganda. 500 African leaders in the room, including uh, three presidents from not only Uganda, but also uh, Nigeria and Senegal. And Norman Borlaug gave a powerful speech, and at the end, he shouted at them, at us in the audience, action, action, action. So, has action happened? Actually, I think yes. Maybe two actions, but not three, the, what Norm really asked for. Nutrition improved in Africa, and the report which we will um, uh, present to you today by the Malabo Montpellier panel called Nourished, How Africa Can Build a Future Free from Hunger and Malnutrition. We have a few copies out there. 
um, documents the tremendous success some countries, actually we look at seven countries, have made. And um, uh, our panel members, the first three speakers on our panel, will say why. What did they got right? What have they gotten right? And um, uh, our fourth panel speaker will mainly emphasize the experiences um, of the German presidency leading this year's G20, the G20 nations, the um, uh, leading uh, industrialized uh, uh, and emerging economy nations. So Germany uh, had um, uh, the opportunity to influence the agenda this year and uh, there was strong emphasis on Africa and on uh, food and nutrition security, which uh, we hope will continue when Argentina takes the presidency next year. Actually, I have good signals from Argentina to have a strong emphasis on agriculture development, sustainable land use, healthy soils, and food security in their emerging agenda. Um, the panel has been introduced. You can read more about us in the beautiful brochures. I don't repeat. Usman, you have the floor. Thank you, Joachim. Uh, thank you, everyone, and good morning. Uh, I've been asked to um, present uh, the work of the uh, Malabo Montpellier panel. I'm waiting for the PowerPoint uh, to be loaded uh, so we can get started. Why the Malabo Montpellier panel and forum? It's because we want to learn from progress. For the first time in the history of Africa, we have had solid two decades of unprecedented growth. There has been quite a bit of positive change uh, across the continent. We still do face challenges, however. So if you want to meet those challenges in the future, then there's no better way than looking at what works on the ground, learning from the opportunities that we have seen that have driven that progress. So, the main thing that the Montpellier Malabo Panel Forum would like to do is to seize the opportunities that exist around Africa to learn from past progress, to help spread the progress and have more people and more countries make progress. You look at the maps of growth in Africa in the 90s and 2000, the darker the color of a country, the higher its growth rate, more countries are growing and are growing much faster. Uh, despite the challenges that we have, what can we learn from that? What happened? We've never had something like that in the 60 years of post-colonial Africa. Uh, you look at, across the continent again, uh, countries are spending more for agriculture, almost doubled between the 90s and the 2000s, the annual outlays, and agricultural domestic products has grown by two-thirds. On the um, nutrition and poverty front, again, uh, there have been a decrease in poverty and there have been decrease in malnutrition depending on which indicator you use. The uh, question is not the magnitude and the impact, but the how and the whys so that we can learn from that. So what the Malabo Montpellier panel does differently is to try and find out where there is progress in any strategic area in Africa. Understand what works, why it works and how, and draw lessons in order to enhance progress where it exists and spread it broadly to where it doesn't exist. But because it doesn't just stop at understanding and finding out what works, uh, that has to be translated into action we have the Malabo Montpellier Forum, which creates a space for leaders at the highest level, those who set the agenda, those who direct what happens. We engage with decision makers at ministerial level to disseminate and encourage adoption of the uh, best practices. Basically, you have uh, 10 to 12 ministers in one room to go through what we figured out in every specific area is working, why is working, and how it's working. Here are the members of the panel. You can see them on the, uh, on, the net, on the website. I'm not going to talk much about it. Here's the first report on uh, nutrition. 
what works in fighting malnutrition in Africa, what can we learn from that? Uh, which are the countries that are making progress? What do they do right? How does it work, actually? And why does it work in those countries? You have here seven countries we looked at that have made the most progress in uh, using the Global Hunger Index of IFPRI between 40 to 6% reduction over a 10-year period. There are 12 recommendations in the report, and you'll find, uh, I think, uh, uh, some outside uh, in the resource, uh, on the resource table. Uh, 12 recommendations are in there. I'm just gonna be talking about three of them. At the policy level, uh, those countries have elevated nutrition as a top policy priority for the entire government. They have defined clear action agenda items across parts of governments. Ministries and agents have worked on that. And programmatically, they have worked on the ground uh, in a proactive way to target interventions to find problems where they are and have actions that work. You could find details uh, in the report, but that's what summarizes and that's what sets them apart. Those lessons will be taken now to uh, the Malabo Montpellier Forum, uh, where ministers from those countries that really achieve the most progress and ministers from other countries are going to be sitting around the table. Uh, the Malabo Montpellier Forum is uh, chaired or co-chaired by the Right Honorable uh, Dr. Solis Klaus Chilima, VP of Malawi, and His Excellency Abdullah Biochane, the Minister of Planning and Development for the Republic of Benin. So the first meeting based on this report is taking place uh, in November, uh, November 14 in Cotonou, uh, bringing ministers from those different uh, parties. Thank you, uh, and this is the work of the Malabo panel and the Malabo Party Forum. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Osman. <clears throat> Ibiza, you're next. I want to run through the panel. Um, if someone of you has a very urgent question in between, um, walk up to the microphone, and hopefully I see you. Currently, I see nobody. Ibiza. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I, I would like to uh, begin uh, to, by establishing that, that this report on how Africa can build a future free from hunger and malnutrition is premised on the aspirations of the Sustainable Development Goal number two that asks for ending hunger, achieve food security, and, and uh, increase nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. Combining the aspirations of the nutrition community and the sustainable agricultural community in a single statement, as uh, this report attempts to do, requires elevating the dialogue and synergizing efforts so, so that to align the goals of nutrition and sustainable agriculture sectors into a common into a common and even more ambitious agenda. Our colleagues uh, are coming back from their policy lobbying session outside with the previous panel. <laughs> Let them walk in and then we calm down. Uh, can we get the, clo the door closed? Thank you. Back. Combining these two agendas into a common goal is not necessarily a complex agenda, and it's not because, in principle, fundamentally it's not complex, and it's not because they are in any way diametrically opposed to each other. A productive, diverse, ecologically and socially sustainable agricultural system has long been recognized as a, being crucial for shaping healthy diets and improved human nutrition. The 1937 League of Nations report on the relation of nutrition to health, agriculture and economic policy, recognize the importance of agricultural adaptation for dietary diversification, noting that changes in production decision that supported more fruits and vegetables could lead to nutritional benefit. As history would have it, at the end of the Second World, however, the urgency of the time shifted the agenda and focus so that increasing, increasing food production emerged as fundamental to fighting hunger, reducing social inequalities, 
in lifting families out of poverty. Decades of generous research investment created and established international agricultural research centers, provided opportunities for brilliant scientists, the first generation of scientists, such as Norman Borlaug, M.S. Swaminathan, Henry Bichel, and Gurdjieff Kush, just to limit the names to those that worked on wheat and rice, the opportunities to generate green revolution technologies of high yield wheat and rice, doubling cereal yields in Latin America and Asia. However, part of that legacy led to persistent emphasis on expanding production of a short list of staples. Just three food crops today, rice, maize, and wheat, provide nearly two-thirds of global dietary energy intake. The global supply of ancient grains, pulses, fruits, and vegetables, the primary sources of diversity in most diets of the old world, became insufficient to meet recommended population level intake. At the same time, agriculture increasingly became an engine not only for producing food, but for generating animal feed, biofuels, and industrial ingredients for processed food products, including, including sugar, sweetened beverages, ready-to-eat meals and snacks. In any case, as you would know, Africa missed on the Green Revolution with its many successes and its few limitations. Aspirations that are now embedded in the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, the Africa Union's Agenda 2063, and the Malabo Declaration, and that we try to focus on this morning in our report, Nourished, are meant to enhance the chances, are meant to enhance the chances in which Africa will become both a contributor and beneficiary towards a future free from hunger and malnutrition. To have this chance, Africa's food and agriculture sector should be expected to provide integrative solution that combine malnutrition on multiple fronts across the spectrum from deficiencies of energy and micronutrients to fighting over overconsumption, obesity, and related diseases. Unfortunately, in a continent so nakedly exposed to climate change and associated shocks and distresses, including conflicts and protracted crises, recurring famine and vulnerabilities in food and nutrition continue to persist. Unlocking Africa's agriculture sector in a way that captures synergies among nutrition, health, and food production would necessitate an integrative approach of major decision-making entities. All these entities ranging from consumers and households, farmers and producers, research and development organizations, NGOs and civil societies, uh, uh, civil science societies, uh, uh, organizations, governments, and agencies that enable investments in science, technology, innovation, and markets, as well as promulgate policy and instruments. Orchestrating these integrative approaches is the challenge that we face. Policy decisions will need to be communicated in a consistent and clear message to guide the goals and food production in Africa. If the goals of agriculture are to be aligned, with our aspirations of healthy diet, diversity of crops must be prioritized along the critical goals of enhancing staple crop productivity. As a plant breeder, to achieve the Malabo Declaration targets of reducing, stunting, wasting, and underweight, and ensuring di diversity of women and meeting minimum dietary standards for African infants by 2025, a revitalized African food system food system that involves research development policy perspective will need to include a variety of options and recommendations. One, we need to improve major staples for nutritional quality by biofortifications and build reliable avenues for their delivery and impact. Second, improve, we need investment to improve nutrient-dense ancient grains, both African and introduced, for greater productivity. Third, we need to expand and introduce the production and use of pulses, fruits, and vegetables into many more communities. There is an enormous under <clears throat> unrealized market potential in the production of ancient grains 
pulses, fruits, and vegetables in African communities that could contribute to new livelihood opportunities for millions of smallholder farmers. These same crops are essential for preventing undernutrition, obesity, and diet-related diseases that together contribute to increases in health-related costs and lost productivity. Parallel efforts are needed to strengthen the functioning of markets and adapting value, food value chains to accompany these enhanced production efficiencies. It will require a massive campaign for evidence-based behavioral change education, strategies that reflect that enormously successful barrage of commercial marketing approaches used by the food and beverage industry that promote highly processed food and beverages so that we may instill appreciation and respect for the importance and values of quality diet and nutrition. Wholesome food systems also have the potential to affect food safety, exposure to infectious Ill illnesses, food prices, household income, and women's access to productive resources, all of which are key mediators of nutrition and health. Finally, furthermore, as the report clearly states, since much of the data necessary for policy action are not readily available in many African countries, data platforms need to be built, metrics harmonized, and tracking systems established to effectively combat malnutrition and to proactively fend off nutritional problems before a food crisis erupts. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Unless a healthy diet is grown, it, it won't be in the households. Uh, thank you very much. Nachi, Clara. You're, you're on. All right. Thank you very much, Joachim. And also, I should take the opportunity to thank uh, the World Food Prize Committee and um, uh, Ambassador Queen for giving us this opportunity to discuss one of the biggest challenges of our time that's facing the food system globally. Uh, the food system is failing to provide adequate and nutritious food to everyone that needs it. And our hope is that through this panel, we can share some of the experiences from uh, seven African countries that face the same challenge and have made progress. I want to say that this is a big issue for us, particularly in Africa, because 45% of uh, you know, child mortality, malnutrition accounts for 45% of child mortality. This is a big issue that we should care about. That means that we should change the steps that we've taken in terms of dealing with the problem of, of malnutrition. Um, as an African leader myself, I think my point of departure is to look at what existing targets have been put in Africa to combat the problem of malnutrition. I think Debbie C touched on them to say that our African leaders during the Malabo African Union Heads of State Summit committed themselves to reduce stunting, committed themselves to reduce malnutrition by 2025. Um, I think the benefits of doing that are not only because we would reduce the number of children that are dying from malnutrition. I think we heard yesterday from one of our biggest champions uh, in the fight against malnutrition, the laureate, uh, Dr. Akin Adesina, he made it very clear to us that the reason why he uh, launched the African Leaders on Nutrition is because there's also an economic cost to keeping children malnourished. The levels of stunted children we have today means that our economies and opportunities in future, including for the burgeoning African population, will not be created. So I think those are one of the sort of the key points that we need to, uh, to take a look at. Um, I think also, if we, ha we are going to address the problem of malnutrition, we need to then to cleverly look at how we harness uh, the agriculture opportunity. I think in the last panel, there's a mention of who is not on the table, uh, which voices are not represented. But I think I should say that uh, uh, I, I'm coming from a country where I, I can brag that my minister from Zambia is the only one who's in the audience and is here listening to this panel and also listening to views and perspectives from other people. She's got a plan in terms of how to revitalize agriculture. She's got a plan to build agriculture city. And what that means is that uh, activity won't just be on the farm, it means that there will be a range of infrastructure, health infrastructure, education infrastructure that will be created, that we've learned through our report that uh, it's not just about a single shot bullet that is needed to address 
dramatically the malnutrition problem. A number of the countries, including the ones that are war torn, like Angola, were able to reduce the malnutrition problem by you know, putting together a set of policies. They actually uh, uh, implemented comprehensive policies that range from not only agriculture and health, but looking at other sectors such as water and sanitation. So I think going forward, it's important that uh, we really keep drumming the bit that uh, to win the, the fight against, against malnutrition, it's not a single approach that's going to win the fight. We have to be embarrassed enough about the situation. In my country, 37% of children uh, are stunted, right? That's the statistics that, that angers me, and that also angers my minister. And so next year, when we come back to the World Food Prize, we'll be able to share with you what we have done about the situation. Um, I also wanted to say that uh, malnutrition is also a political question. If the issue of, of, of dealing with malnutrition is not put on top of the political agenda, progress will not be achieved. And what we found from the seven countries that we studied, from Angola to Senegal to Cameroon, uh, this is an issue that was put on the, at, the right, at the highest level of government, either in the presidency, either in the National Planning and Development Commission, or the Prime Minister's office. And the other thing that was a common feature amongst the successful countries was that there was investment in data. There was seriousness in terms of tracking progress. Um, in the previous session, I think there were four principles that were mentioned as crucial to help us move forward, transformation, um, alignment, integration. From this panel, I would like to add that accountability is very important. And you cannot be accountable if you're not investing in data. So one of the recommendations that we're putting forward, based on what we've seen has worked in other countries, is that countries that are doing poorly need to make the necessary investments um, in, 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 in tracking progress ar around malnutrition. Um, I think the other point I wanted to also add is that because of the multisectoral nature, of, of the challenge of, of dealing with malnutrition, um, no one person can do it alone. No one sector of, of the entire you know, society can do it alone. This is not just a problem for government to deal with, right? So in most of these countries, there was strong collaboration across uh, you know, different um, sectors from private sectors. The private sector was very much involved in Ghana in terms of bringing forward solutions that help to fast track progress. Civil society also playing their role in terms of uh, doing the education and delivery of certain programs that were needed. So I just wanted to uh, underscore the other principle that was raised in the previous panel on the importance of, of partnership uh, for us to win, to win this war. And again, I want to come back on the uh, economic uh, imperative of this. We know that uh, most, our, most of our governments struggle with finances in terms of making decisions in terms of where they put their limited resources. But the good news is that when you make the investments in, in nutrition, uh, the data that exists out there is that a dollar investment in nutrition gets back for the economy $16. So that makes economic sense. I mean, we have a moral obligation to deal with this. And um, I think we, we, we've, we've really been shown that uh, without uh, bold and consistent action, that's multi-sectoral and implementation. I think part of the challenge we normally have is that we have a whole range of good policies, good knowledge that's gathered, but it's not implemented. And in, most, in all the seven countries, each one of them were very serious in making sure that each government department and ministry that was responsible was implementing, was budgeting the resources that are needed and was implementing and accounting. So I'll leave it at that for now, and um, I guess I'll pass it on to Stefan. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nachilala, for mentioning and emphasizing the need for policy change. It's no surprise that this uh, document, the Malabo Montpellier report on uh, improved nutrition in Africa, has um, half of its recommendation really as policy innovations which need to come along with the seed innovations and the technological side, uh, which Gibiza uh, emphasized. The policy innovations are the ones which made the trick in the seven countries which have been um, presented uh, uh, and which we analyzed in this report systematically. Uh, Stefan, this uh, year, um, 2017, has been 
a particularly dense one for you. Um, as Deputy Director General of the uh, Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, not only due to G20, but uh, mainly so. Um, and uh, tell us a bit um, what came out um, and uh, um, how, how you see the future of the cooperation, um, uh, which um, we have also heard uh, as uh, a recommendation from the administrator of USAID, Mr. Green. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Joachim. Um, well, yeah. Uh, four years ago, the BMZ, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, launched a One World uh, No Hunger Initiative. And uh, most of you, I think, who are, you are f perhaps familiar with the Feed the Future initiative of the US government. It's about the same idea of, of a comprehensive approach um, uh, to that uh, uh, challenge. Um, with this, under this initiative, Germany has been able to considerably increase its effort to address the issue of, um, of hunger and malnutrition and has become one of the largest donors in this field next to the European Commission, the United States uh, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This One World No Hunger initiative has a strong focus on Africa and follows in general, generally speaking, three goals. First, promote innovation and increase productivity in the agriculture and food sector. Second, make sure that no one is left behind, that everybody, and in particular vulnerable groups, women and children, have access to affordable and nutritious food. And third, promote a sustainable use of and an equal secure access to natural resources. We see the need in particular to stop and reverse land degradation, in particular in Africa, which seems to be a real, a serious problem, and to improve land governance and land rights. We have not only launched targeted bilateral programs and contributed to multilateral endeavors. We also took the chance to co-shape the international food security agenda. In particular, we took advantage of the fact that Germany was holding first G7 presidency in 2015 and is still, as Joachim pointed to, holding G20 presidency this year. Under German presidency in 2015, the G7 agreed to help 500 million people out of hunger and malnutrition by 2030. This, the G7 took adequate responsibility and their share to reach SDG 2. But the G7 have not only set this strong numerical target. They also agreed on how to reach that ambitious goal. They agreed on a so-called broad approach. They underlined that higher yields, higher productivity in agriculture is necessary but not sufficient to solve the problem. They underscored their commitment not just to invest in agriculture but also in nutrition-related measures, resource management, and land governance. These are the main extra miles we all have to go. This year, again under German presidency, the G20 once again underlined the link between food security, agriculture, and broader rural development. They put an emphasis on rural youth employment. Today, 1.2 billion young people between ages 15 and 24 live in the world. In Africa alone, 440 million young people will enter the labor market by 2030. A majority 
of them in rural areas. This is a tremendous challenge that must be turned into an opportunity. The youth bulge we were all talking about must be turned into a demographic dividend. The rural youth must become the drivers of inclusive rural transformations and create opportunities for sustainable development that provide them with adequate quality life prospects. The future of the rural world. This was the title of the G20 conference in Berlin in April this year. More than a thousand participants, among them very many young people from civil society, private sector and science discussed and adopted the Berlin Charter for Rural Development. This charter provides very valuable guiding principles and policy recommendations for rural development. It was very encouraging to see the enthusiasm and the commitment of the young people in this conference and in particular in the whole preparatory process. And their, their signal, their political signal was very, very clear. They, they stay ready and they are willing and able to make a difference and to improve livelihoods and to take um, uh, the responsibility and invest in agriculture and food chain if the political framework conditions, the conducive uh, are right and the uh, environment is conducive. And that was very, very clear. The G20 heads of states and government referred to this uh, uh, Berlin Charter when in July in Hamburg they launched the initiative for rural youth employment. This initiative is unique and ambitious. For the first time, the G20 agreed on very specific numerical targets. For example, enabling five million young people to benefit from training opportunities and creating one, billion, one million jobs for young people by 2022. But how can a transformation of the rural economy in Africa be achieved? Where are the job opportunities? What can be done to increase the quality of jobs? The World Bank and IFAD together presented a very interesting study to the G20 helping to answer these questions. They identified three action areas. First, promote growth in the food value chains. Second, ensure that policies don't undermine employment intensity. And three, facilitate the inclusion of women and youth. Now Germany starts to facilitate and to take the lead in the implementation of this initiative. It is very encouraging to see that the issue of rural employment, in particular rural, rural youth employment, receives tremendous attention around the world. It's not only the World Bank and IFAD. It's, for example, the Sahel and West, West Africa Club hosted by the OECD. The Chicago Council on Global Affairs now focuses on this, on this issue. Many donors, the African Development Bank, as we heard earlier to, uh, uh, this morning. We all definitely now should join forces. We should aim at a common understanding of the issue with a strong evidence base, and we should aim at a strong voice. We all should work towards making sure that we overcome the rural-urban divide. The rural world must not be left behind. Instead of becoming a loser in globalization, the rural world must fully benefit from innovation, modernization, and a fair globalization. Germany aims to overcome the traditional donor-recipient relationship. We would like to enter into a new real partnership with Africa, guided by mutual trust and mutual accountability. This is the essence of the Marshall Plan with Africa that has recently been proposed by Germany. In such a partnership, investment is key. Investment in knowledge, in infrastructure, in people, and innovation. And all sources of money is needed, domestic resources, 
private sector investment as well as uh, official development, uh, uh, official um, development assistance. We and we are committed to focus our support or support on reform processes. In this context, we invite Africa to high-level political dialogue. Dialogue with Africa requires an African voice and Africa ownership. Therefore, we very much welcome and support, for example, the comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, CADAP, and the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA, and many other initiatives. And last but not least, we very much appreciate the work of the Malabo Montpellier panel, a unique forum that facilitates north-south political dialogue based on sound evidence base. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, you have uh, heard our panelists. Um, uh, please get ready for your comments and questions. Uh, we need your input. Um, we um, uh, are eager to get uh, comments on the Malabo Montpellier panel report and on the cooperation agenda, which uh, uh, Stefan uh, has uh, laid out. The two are, of course, uh, closely connected. I see there is a line of three over there uh, and a line of one over there. I start with the one over there, please. Introduce yourself. Go ahead. My name is Deepak, and I'm a graduate student in plant pathology, University of Minnesota. And I have a question regarding diversification of food or dietary diversification. Uh, we were talking about some of the countries that have gained success in implementing nutrition as well as um, reducing hunger uh, to a certain extent. How is dietary diversification relevant to Native American cuisine? Is it going to be a cultural change for people to adapt as well? if we are going to implement foreign crops into the countries? And how is dietary diversification cooperated with the aim to feed all mouths and uh, elevate uh, hunger? Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, we take notes, please. Um, first in that line. Sure. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Steinkamp, and I work for Self Help International, an NGO that works in Nicaragua and Ghana. Um, I worked in Nicaragua for several months, and my question is, as we talk about resiliency, sustainability, and development in all corners of the world, do you think we can apply, or are you seeing it applied, the application of best practices in what's considered developed countries to developing countries in sustainable and environmentally friendly approaches in tandem with development? For example, Germany is considered to be a leader in green infrastructure. Can we apply more green infrastructure rather than gray as we work together in development, um, especially seeing the issues with climate change? Okay, second in that line. Thank you very much. My name is Bongi Wenjobe. I'm South African, but I'm here in my capacity as the chair of the Global Forum for Agricultural Research. Um, I'd just like to, I'm, I'm very excited by the outcome of the Montpellier Malabo panel because, particularly because of its political, African political leadership in driving implementation. My question to the panel is, do you think, based on the work that you did on nutrition, there's an opportunity for a nutrition-led growth strategy for agriculture in Africa? If so, what would be the risks and opportunities that that would present for us? Thank you. Next. Julie Howard, Michigan State University. I'm very happy to hear all of the talk about evidence and accountability from this panel, but I'd like to have an update on, on how we're doing in terms of setting up data systems uh, at the national level and regional level. Are those improving? That's been, a, that's been a continuing problem over the years. On accountability, as I seem to recall, as part of the Malabo Agreement, there is meant to be a, a national accountability session each year to review progress on agriculture nutrition. Could we have an update on that? And finally, sorry, really happy to hear all of the discussion about, about rural youth employment, but there's very, very little evidence there. There's been very little funding for funding impact evaluation. So I'm wondering what the panel's position is. Thank you. Good. Next, please. My name is Timothy Williams. I work for the International Water Management Institute. Please speak up. My name is Timothy Williams. I work for the International Water Management Institute. It was really uh, very good to hear the 
summary of the Montpellier panel report on, on nutrition. But I think the challenge facing Africa is uh, doubly difficult in terms of climatic change happening across the continent and also the issue of um, conflict and uh, states coming out of uh, fragile states. And I, my question really is, do we really have a, a nuanced approach to the heterogeneity in Africa in terms of tackling nutrition? Because um, from what I've heard, it seems as if the program is more or less um, uniformly based across the continent, but we do know that there's so much heterogeneity and the problem, especially in conflict reading states, is very much. Extremely important point. I'm sure there are lots of more important points in the audience. We have to wrap this up in five minutes. Those at the microphone, you have one sentence each. Uh, either make a powerful point or a question. Please go ahead and then the two of you. That's it. Thank you. Um, Anthony Zui from University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. I was wondering whether the panel could say something about the state of evidence that's available about forms of um, collective organization and um, networks of rural uh, farmers and communities okay. in engaging around these agendas. Great point, go ahead. My name is Christian Scott from Pennsylvania State University. Um, and I'm wondering, you talked about the role of um, incorporating vulnerable populations. Um, and I'm wondering about risk and the perceptions and the realities of risk specifically facing these vulnerable populations. Okay. Thank you. My name is Rachel Opole. I come from CALRO, which is Kenya Agriculture and Livestock Research Organization. To the Minister for Agriculture, I think, in Zambia, I don't think our African children need to be malnutrition, uh, suffer malnutrition anymore because we are, we are, we are um, endowed with a lot of um, local crops. In Kenya, we have finger millet and sorghum. These are crops that can provide all the nutrition that the children need. So maybe we can dialogue later on and I'll give you uh, some insights on some of these crops that can improve child malnutrition. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, panel members, uh, it's as usual, too little time for too big an agenda, but there's lunch break and uh, there's email thereafter. Um, I go the same direction, Usman. Um, uh, pick and choose, but don't pick the easy ones. Okay, yeah? I'll pick the hardest ones. All right, thank you. Uh, first, on um, can we have a, a nutrition-driven uh, agriculture development agenda, or how do we deal with heterogeneity on dealing with nutrition? I think we can put those two uh, together. Um, uh, where we're starting from is that, um, especially nutrition, this will be maybe different in different cases, uh, we should have much better nutrition outcomes with the resources we have at hand. We are underachieving because many governments are just at a loss. They don't know where to start and how to do it, how to wrap their hands around uh, these problems. So that's why we think that figuring out where things are working and how it's working and why, and giving people the sense of being able to enact change uh, to achieve better uh, results with the resources they have, while they can harness more resources for much bigger results, is extremely important. Now, whether we call it nutrition-based agriculture development or how we do heterogeneity, we think that showing what works and why and how it works, and then addressing the leaders at the highest level, those who will take and set the agenda to understand that there's a possibility to make change here. Uh, next on accountability and numbers and data, uh, there have been an amazing thing that happened this year. The first, uh, actually it's happening now, uh, the first um, round of the biennial review that African heads of states have mandated. They have asked all the countries to come and report every two years on each and every of the targets under Malabo. Uh, we've been working very hard, um, we IFPRI and our programs in Africa, to support countries to prepare and deliver the reports. 43 out of 55 
And you know, out of those 55, there's some that wouldn't do it, uh, Central African Republic, Somalia, and so on. So mostly more than 90% of those who would have turned in a report. Uh, and it's been quite a successful round. It's going to the ministers in the coming weeks and to the heads of states in January. Mm -hmm. And the data system and the river systems are in place in those countries. Mm -hmm. I'll take up that question about diversification and the concerns about investments in research in that area. I think, you know, the developed world is doing very well in diversifying their diets, concepts understood about the variety of foods to eat. And then over time, uh, in, through globalization, uh, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm extremely amazed in 40 years since I started living in the United States how diets have changed in the U.S. and now global plates, the plates are <coughs> representing the diversity of the world, the endowments uh, nature had given us is really represented daily <coughs> in the plates of my family and others in the United States. <coughs> but the concern that we're expressing, <coughs> excuse me, is with all the endowments that we have around the world and the blessings that have come to the world from the old world, and unfortunately, the old world's diets had shrunk um, with climate change and the pressures from uh, the market and, and also emphasis on the few major crops that have really benefited from investments in agricultural research. And, and now, as palates get sophisticated in the developed world, these incredible ancient grains of the old world are finding themselves on the plates of people in the developed world. And so unfortunately, with limited investment in those crops to increase their productivity, the few production tonnage that we get in the developed world end up on the, on the plates of people in the developed world and, and not meeting the crucial diet needs of people in, in developing countries. And so that's part of what the recommendation we're making is that I think these empty calories that are in the major crops of sorghum and corn and so on need to go through biofortifications to benefit an enhancement of nutritional quality. At the same time, we need productivity gains incorporated through investments in research in these in ancient grains, you know, the grains like teff in my country, where the poor, my neighborhood, my village that produces a lot of uh, teff, I don't see them on the plates of people in, 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 the, in the villages. They go to the market because they, they fetch more money for them. The same for quinoa and chia, amaranth from, you know, from Latin America. And so these double approaches or multi-approaches of uh, asking for greater investment so that the benefits of you know, the uh, results of technology generation from enriching the endowments that nature had given us could be exploited fully is uh, the essence of the message. Colleagues, we are in overtime. Um, so very brief, Achilana. I'll be super brief. So um, the climate challenge, climate change challenge and the conflict challenge do make the situation worse and vulnerable in Africa because of the effects on the quality of the crop and, and, and the output. But I think for us, what we're saying uh, from our report is that the answer is to ensure that the research agenda uh, connects with the climate uh, variations that are, that are happening because the consequence of not doing that is that uh, uh, the amount of food that's available will go down and the food prices are also going to um, go up. So uh, in, in West Africa, they have what is called the West African Service Center on Climate Change and, and Adaptive Land Use. Ten countries are participating and are investing in that. So we need more African countries participating in that and maybe more partners coming on board to support that to support African countries respond to the climate challenge. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would like to pick up the, the question of, um, uh, of transfer of experience, of, of knowledge and so. Um, of course, this is, this is a crucial point, um, but I would say um, next to North-South learning and dialogue, South-South learning is equally important and we all should think of how we could foster that kind of thing. Anyway, um, in this, well, coming back to the North-South uh, North exchange and this, this panel is about, uh, about these, these questions. I mean, Africa 
has two great challenges from my perspective. One is the, the trade issues. African internal trade is far too weak. There are lots of trade barriers of various kinds. And the other thing is uh, many weak organizational structures. So there is, there is really a, a great potential for, for improvement. And in this, in, when it comes to organizational, not, not technology in a, in a narrower sense, but in the broader sense, how to manage a sector, how to manage a, a, a business, how to bring people together, uh, how to create f um, producer organizations, and so give them a strong voice. That is something um, we can offer, not just from Germany, I think all over in, uh, in Europe and, and the US, we, I think we had made good experience with that, with good policies. And we invite uh, our partners to come to see in Germany how things run, and that's not everything they can learn from that. that there are a few things I think there are is, is, is good for, for learning and for, 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 for dialogue. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Let me close with two remarks. One is um, um, lots of people think we live in troubled times. Ending hunger, the fight against hunger, must not uh, be affected by this. Actually, I believe there is a large island of consensus to, in this time, address the hunger issue collectively across the Atlantic between Europe and the United States. Second remark is um, Africa has its own agenda. The development partners need to support that. That's what the Malabo Montpellier panel is about, rather than imposing external agendas. And the third, which I didn't suggest at the beginning, uh, Gordon, let's emphasize evidence base and respect for science. That's it. Just, just two things. Stefan, the, there's a South-South partnership that got launched here earlier this week between the Brazilians and the Africans on the savannas, and I think that's a most exciting partnership that's coming forward. And just going back to that last point of, of Joachim's, we're talking here about policies, new policies in particular, implementing policies that are evidence-based. That means the evidence from science, from technology, from the social sciences, from economics. That's the way we're trying to do it in the Montpellier panel. It's the way that w w One World No Hunger is also trying to do it. It's, it's the trademark of what we're all about these days. Thank you all. Thank you, the panel. The lunch is up one floor. Is that right? Yes. Up one floor right now, and Raj Shah is going to be speaking. That was good.